There are those who seek to unravel the mysteries of life and death. And on this night, one such individual stares into an abyss of endless fear, poised to strike and unleash the eldritch and malevolent terror at Collinwood. Welcome to Episode 5 of Terror at Collinwood. I am your ghost host, Penny Dreadful, a.k.a. Danielle, whatever you want to call me. It's like Vicky or Victoria, right? You can, it doesn't matter either way. It works. It works both ways. My guest today is an award-winning independent director, screenwriter, and producer. He recently won the well-deserved Rondo Award for Best Short Film for The Thousand and One Lives of Dr. Mabuse, which of course starred Jerry Lacey. He has directed several independent feature films and short subjects, several of which feature the actors from Dark Shadows, including David Selby, Lara Parker, Catherine Lee Scott, Jerry Lacey, Lisa Richards, and the late, great Christopher Pennock. He first gained uh, attention with his revisionist Dr. Mabuse films, the first of which premiered uh, in limited theatrical release in May of 2013, with its follow-up feature releasing the following year. In 2014, he wrote and directed the delightful six-part anthology series, Theater Fantastique. In 2017, he directed a second season. The complete series was later released to DVD by Alpha New Cinema. In 2015, his Lovecraft noir feature film, The Last Case of August T. Harrison, made the rounds at film festivals across the country. Between 2015 and 2017, he worked on the Detective Adam Sarah Chronicles, a comic book style serial that follows the fantastical misadventures of disturbed detective Adam Sarah. In 2018, his film Will and Liz, a love story, was released on Amazon Prime Video. In 2019, his atmospheric film Loon Lake was released to great acclaim, an eerie psychological thriller dealing with grief and witchcraft. The film was shot on location in Minnesota and is available on Amazon Prime. In 2017, his short, The Most Haunted House in Venice Beach, was released. I just watched it and it's awesome. And he recently announced the upcoming Todd Tarantula. You can find many of his short films at the Hollinsworth Productions YouTube page. I am delighted to welcome my guest today, Ansel Farage. Hi, Ansel. Hey, thank you for having me. <laughs> it is my pleasure. I am honored. Wow, what a body of work. Holy moly. Like, I, <laughs> such cool stuff. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, Ansel, as a filmmaker. Like, what got you into making films? So... I, uh, when I was six years old, I saw the Claude Rains Phantom of the Opera. And shortly thereafter, I saw House of Dark Shadows mm -hmm. on videotape. And those both sort of cemented my desire to, to do that, to make movies and to, to make monster movies and, and scare people and whatnot. And I don't come from an industry family. I don't come from a Hollywood background. Uh, I just grew up watching a lot of movies with my family. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I was a, a young kid when TCM was launched. So I was one of their very first viewers. And so it's just, just a love of, of cinema. And plus I'm from LA and you know, this is Hollywood, quote unquote. Hollywood and uh, it's an industry town so the movies are kind of part of our fabric here mm -hmm. and uh, kind of inescapable and it's a tough tough ruthless industry but I would not rather be doing anything else I love it mm -hmm. so yeah <laughs> you know uh, I've watched several of your films Loon Lake was a masterpiece uh, it, it just really eerie and atmospheric and then uh, you know the theater fantastic and just a, a, such a cool uh, anthology series. And I, I have several questions about these things, but I'll start with Theater Fantastique. The, the, the sense I got 
lot watching. I watched the one where you had uh, you had Laura Parker in it and you had Chris Pennock and you had Jerry Lacey. And it reminded me a Battle lot. Of Sir. Yes. Battle of Sir. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It reminded me a lot of Mario Bava, uh, like um, the lighting, the the, oh, yeah. the color gel lighting and just the yeah. mood and the tone. Was that a, was Bava an inspiration at all? Are you a fan of Mario Bava's? Or? I'll be, oh, yes, definitely. Um, so. <laughs> I'll, I can be very more specific with that. So at least with the first season, you know, each of the stories, we did two Poe tales and then we started branching out. And the Madame Lasseur episode in particular, I, 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 okay, well, I was also a teenager when, you know, DVD launched. So mm -hmm. uh, MGM had the midnight movies and that's all the Roger Corman and Grell and Poe's and all of the, you know, the a American international films and stuff. So I grew up, or as a teenager, I was growing up with buying all of those and just loving every second of those like 1960s films and and the style and, and Mark Baba is definitely part of that line of Planet of the Vampires and, mm -hmm. and several other films. And uh, so Madame Lasseur, I wanted to do my best with no money, by the way, in a four by four, or sorry, eight by eight garage <laughs> um, uh, to emulate the American international atmosphere and style. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that episode, and, and also I, I, I've been thinking of this character of Madame Lister and her ghostly companion, Johnny Stoker, for a long time. And I have an amazing feature film script that is set in 1971. And it is just a love letter to American International. Oh, wonderful. And to the drive-in, well, basically just into the, really to the AIP films and, um, do you mean, you know, do you mean the, the, the Corman? And, oh, okay. Okay. I was going to say, do you mean the, the Corman? And, and right. Corman, yeah. 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 Oh, I love the, all of those. And, yeah. Uh, those are great. So yeah. that's, that's a very long answer to your initial question. Oh, but yeah, please. Madame Lasseur was, was definitely influenced. There's also the later episode, A Poem of Poe, and uh -huh. that I was totally, uh, there was even in the script, it said Mario Baba shots, Mario Baba shots. Oh, for wonderful, wonderful. Certain angles and stuff. So yeah, it was definitely yeah. a strong influence. Absolutely. Everybody starts shaking when I get the colored gels out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that stuff. And uh, I think, you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but I, I think Dan Curtis certainly, uh, you know, we know he was a fan of of the universal horror films, but I, I strongly suspect he was also influenced by uh, some of those, you know, the AIP films, particularly the post cycle that Corman yeah. did. And also the, uh, I'm sure he must have watched Bava as well. I mean, there's even. He had to have seen Black Sunday. I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. With the mask of ball, uh, I think with buried with Judas Zachary on his where his head would be I, I just there were definitely echoes of of that film there of black sunday there merged with uh the thing that couldn't die certainly you know the, yeah yeah that's definitely i just recently, I just recently <laughs> saw that i okay well, no i'm kidding. sorry we're gonna keep yeah. out oh um, let's go for it that's what this I, is all about <laughs> also i i so i mean that's one of the more elusive universal films and then screen factory just put it out uh, what is it, last August as part of their thank you, Scream Factory, for all of those, those yeah. universal <laughs> horror Blu-rays. I love it. Yeah. Um, and I, everybody on the classic horror film board was like ragging on <laughs> Thing that couldn't die and whatnot. Aww, so I, I, went in, <laughs> I went in with sort of zero expectations. It's one of the very few films of, of the universal cycle that I had not seen. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I was like, I know what I'm getting it. This is just cheap and fun. And it was, it was a yeah, good yeah, time. Totally. So I, yeah, I what, they totally did that with uh, Judah Zachary. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't, I don't, what is it with warlocks getting their heads chopped off and then come, you know, their heads possessing people because it was the thing that couldn't die I think was we saw it there but then we also saw it in um we saw it in Dark Shadows with Judah Zachary and then there was um, the Paul Nashi film the Paul Nashi film yeah yeah uh Oh gosh, I hosted it. Horror rises from the tomb. Yeah. Horror rises from the tomb, and it's like, is this is like a theme? It's like a thematic thing. Like, and then, what <laughs> just to just to, you know, to my own horn, Mary Jane and Loon Lake. Her head is chopped off. Yes, with, yes, with exactly. <laughs> Which I want to talk about that too. And I did it we'll in my that. show too with my brother Nicholas Dreadful. You know, had his head chopped off too. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about Loon Lake too. Now that very much uh, it was very eerie and atmospheric, and there was a lot of uh, folklore in there. You had uh, you had David Selby and Catherine Lee Scott in there, which was fantastic to see them Thank in you. that movie. And uh, just what a great, great film. And my question is the the witch character to Terlinden. Now, I, I remember listening to you on uh, Monster Kid Radio on Derek's podcast, and you mentioned mm -hmm. something about that being based on actual an actual thing that happened. Is that 
true? Was there like a beheading of a su- suspected witch in Minnesota or what? So, well, it's to to give the greater context, Nathan Wilson, who who's my most frequent collaborator and, and we write together and he's been in almost all my films. He grew up there and uh, he's from Round Lake, Minnesota and grew up with this legend of Mary Jane, the Witch of Loon Lake. There is a Mary Jane buried in the cemetery. Mm-hmm. Uh, the legend says that there were several witches that made, they, they sort of, the town made a deal with them and uh, they lived off in the woods and the, the settle, the settlement ship after they massacred the Indians, by the way, the, uh, the, the recent settlement ship made a deal with the witches and they stayed off in the woods and then it went bad and they executed one of the witches and it took three chops for her head to come off and she cursed the town and her curse is upon the uh, the tombstone. And all of this was invented by the gasoline station owner that lived down the road in the 50s mm-hmm. so that he could get people to come to his gas station and then say, oh, go up the down the road, you know, and there's a cemetery and there's oh. a witch bird over there. Oh, and, okay. But having said that, there is something going on there uh in that cemetery mm-hmm. and most everybody there believes in something and has had a loon lake cemetery experience and some people outrightly say oh no it's, it's not true at all and some people say no i've seen things and so everybody has as in as you see in the film everybody has their own story and their own interpretation mm-hmm. of what went down there is the legend about there was a church out there that caught on fire mysteriously. So we incorporated all of this yeah. real life folk legends uh, into the script. And just personally speaking, you know, going back to AIP, I have always wanted to do, I had always wanted to do a thriller in daylight a folk horror film, which Finder General is one of my favorite movies ever. Oh, I terrible. love Blood on Satan's Claw. Yeah, yes. um, so, and The Wicker Man, you know, all the, the three main folk horrors, Cry of the Banshee. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and Nate had always talked about this, you know, there's a haunted cemetery, you know, like 10 minutes down from my parents' farm. And then, I mean, we've known each other for like 10 years. So over the course of 10 years, we're like, oh, let's let's do it. So we wrote the script together and incorporated all of this, as I said, real life folklore from the area mm-hmm. and tried to be as authentic and genuine to the area and its beliefs and its landscapes. And I got to then play in the folk horror filmmaking sandbox with all of that. Mm-hmm. And David Selby was never intended to to initially be part of the film. So there's the the line at the beginning of the film when they execute Mary Jane the witch, and the the pastor says, "Let the devil take his own." And that's me just <laughs> just doing a callback to Night of Dark Shadows. <laughs> yeah. And as fate would have it, who ends up delivering that line? But David. Wow. You know, 50 years after filming Night of Dark Shadows, so it's like, well, it, it's kind of <laughs> destiny. It's, it kind of works out. <laughs> yeah, full circle. I I want to yeah. get to working with the Dark Shadows actors because that must have been super exciting to do. Um, and one thing too that you incorporate into Loon Lake, just the sound sound of the loon the yeah. loons in the background when you hear that yeah. it's so chilling like there's something uh-huh. it's such a simple effect just to have that that sound but it's such an eerie sad sound that it just yeah. totally sets the the mood for the film it's, it's great it's very unsettling yeah yeah let me give a, a thank you to david karen who recorded our sound ty var he he mixed it in post production and then bill wandell did our score Mm -hmm. Um, and record, you know, compose the whole soundtrack for the film. And uh, all three of them, like, it takes an army we don't have an army we're we're like a team of five people but it takes it takes an army to to make a quality yeah. project and i'm just really grateful to have yeah. good people on my team definitely so, definitely yeah. now uh you just won a rondo award for uh, the thousand and one lives of dr mabuse and uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that which is awesome congratulations uh, by the way and that character, Dr. Mabuse, has a rich history uh, in, in cinema. And so what brought you to that character in particular and casting uh, Jerry Lacey, too, in the role? That's just so, so awesome. Well, it's 2021. The character is now 100 years old, as a matter of fact, from 1921 wow. to 2021. Mm-hmm. I, being me, 
uh, and being a devout lover of classic film and <laughs> film history. I mean, that's that's my passion is film history. I think you know, I grew up studying whatever film would come my way. So noir was a is a huge, huge uh, influence. I love noir. Fritz yeah. Lang obviously great, directed great quite stuff. a few considerable yeah. noirs, and um, in his early work, you know, Metropolis. Well, okay, also Fritz Forrest J. Ackman with his love mm-hmm. of Metropolis yeah. and. Sure. And speaking to that, so I and, uh, and side note, uh, Fritz Lang also was a Dark Shadows fan, probably he because was, he was Joan, Joan Bennett. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He also he dug Scream and Scream again, so that's that's a oh perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get a little more culty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, uh, but anyway, so he so Metropolis that was like well, I saw that I think that and um, uh, Human Beasts. Mm-hmm. around the same time when I was a kid. And so those my gateway to long, I, you know, from, from reading stuff, I was tangentially familiar with the name Dr. Mabuza, but didn't delve into it further. And then somewhere when I was a kid, I finally saw a testament of Dr. Mabuse and mm-hmm. really enjoyed it really like, cause it's, it's not quite a film noir, but it is, it's not quite a horror film, but it is, it's not quite an action film, but it is, and it's not quite a comic book film yet. It is. Mm-hmm. And it's still incredibly fresh and exciting all these years later, shot in 1932 mm-hmm. in Germany. And, um, and the character of, of Dr. Mabuza was just really fascinating to me. And I was like, I'd love to do something with this guy. And then when I was a teenager, I came up with the idea for what the story could be of of him versus Inspector Lohman. And then when I was 19, 20, somewhere there, I... I never went to film school, so I'm just sort of drifting right out of high school, knowing I want to make movies and having made, you know, several movies growing up and, and getting roping my, my school friends into being in them. So I was constantly teaching myself. So I had a script for Dr. Mabuza and the Dark Shadows film with that Tim Burton directed. It was on its way to theaters. So Dark Shadows had, had become a little more relevant again. And... I decided on a whim, why not Why not send the script to some of the cast? I'd always, I mean, growing up, watching Dark Shadows reruns on Sci-Fi Channel and really watching House of Dark Shadows and Night of Dark Shadows. That's my main territory, Dark Shadows territory, we'll call that, that I was really familiar with as a kid was the two films. So having had that knowledge foundation, <laughs> I was always fascinated with Jerry Lacey's voice. Yes. And I needed a really good voice for Dr. Mabuz. And so I thought, well... Let me just contact. Let me just try it. I mean, what's what's the worst that can happen? They could say no or never respond. So I, you know, dumb little me, I send my scripts. Hi, I'm a teenager. I wrote the script and I'd love for you to play this role. And shockingly, <laughs> they all said yes. And I think it's because they just wow. like this. Well, I know it's because yeah. they like the script. It's yeah. Jerry, Jerry uh, called me back and he said I was going on an, a month long vacation to Italy with my wife, who turned out to be Julia Duffy to just make things even yeah. more intense. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and said, but I really like your script. So, mm-hmm. OK, when do you want to start? And so that's awesome. Yeah, that it was is, trippy. That is really that awesome. was 10 years ago. So now, wow. yeah, here we are. All this time later. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, now, you mentioned that your uh, it sounds like your uh, your introduction to Dark Shadows was actually through the films versus the, the TV show. And then that you sagged into the into the TV show. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about what your what your history is with Dark Shadows, like what got you sucked into Dark Shadows? Right. Well, so as I'm saying, my I, I don't come from an industry family, but my parents watch a lot of movies and television. And my dad's a Star Trek guy and Sinbad mm-hmm. and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Blade Runner. So I had that coming at me from one side. And then my mom is like Dracula and Dark Shadows and Interview with the Vampire and everything inappropriate for a four-year-old. <laughs> um, so she had Catherine's book, uh, My Scrapbook Memories of Dark Shadows, that she went in like 1986 and stood in line and had Catherine and Jonathan Frid autograph when it first came out. So mm-hmm. she would have that. And she'd tell me the various, you know, storyline arcs of the show, of like, you know, and then Julia turned him old and all this stuff as a kid as like bedtime stories. I don't know what the hell she's talking about, but it sounds cool. And then here's the book and here's some photos that start to like illustrate the crazy bedtime stories. But then I'm also seeing the behind the scenes <laughs> photography and what goes into making television, making a show, making a thing, cameras and whatnot. So now as a kid, I'm sitting there and 
starting to consciously think that what I'm looking at on television has actually been made and it isn't just like happening you know, in front of you. Do, you. do you actually consciously think about TV when you're a kid or not? Or it's just, it's just there. But then there's photos from the movie and it says from the film House of Darkness. So my head movie, oh, well, that's... That sounds like that's easy. I mean, there's a movie. I've got plenty of movies. We watch movies all the time. That sounds like digestible if if I, you know, probably don't know that word at the time, but that's that's a good example. <laughs> and then around like what 1994, MGM puts out the videotape and we got it from Hollywood video. And my mom had also never seen the movie. So that's which is bizarre to me because she saw the Don Much Horror at the drive in and yet she didn't see this. <laughs> so like, woman, where were you? But we got it. She let me watch it unsupervised and I got to Carolyn being staked and that kind of did it for me because <laughs> I was intense, really young yeah. <laughs> and it scared the shit out of me. And it was just, you know, so intense and Bob Covert's music with down, 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 but it's like so calm and all hell is breaking loose on screen. It's just this intense dichotomy of contrast and everybody's screaming and they're pounding the stake and their blood's going everywhere. And I don't know what the hell is happening to me, but I'm terrified and enthralled and overwhelmed. And I think she wandered into the room and was like, oh my God, what the hell? is this and took it out and but i was disturbed enough to know that i wanted more and it took me like i think two years to finally see what happened at the end and my god when he turned when he when he did finally turn old and like attacked everybody and it's just blood everywhere at that time then and there's the arrow comes through oh, his yeah. chest like i was like <laughs> i i loved it but i was i was scared shit i remember at the same time and um and then I rewound the tape and I start from the beginning and I just watch over and over and over and over. Could not get enough. And I was looking at the camera angles too. And and then, um, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, aren't I? No, uh, it's fine. Uh, uh, go for okay. it. Okay, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make this all coherent. Oh, no, it's very, like so very much. interesting. This is what I want okay. to hear. Okay. Um, so then Catherine published the Dark Shadows movie book and that had the screenplays for both. Yeah, it's a great so, book. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So I then would sit there and I'd read the script in correspondence with the film. Mm -hmm. And I taught myself all this. I taught myself how to write and how to format a screenplay based off of that. So again, like with David saying the line in Loon Lake from Night of Dark Shadows in a very odd, bizarre way of life. All of my filmmaking uh, education comes almost from Dark Shadows. And then I never went to film school and my first real sort of film ends up with Jerry, Catherine and Laura. And I get flown right head first into the Dark Shadows universe. And it's just, <laughs> it's very strange when you like look back and like see how things like work out and just, sure, it's very, it's very bizarre. Are. Yeah, yeah, and, but it's but it's uh, clearly uh, the the Dark Shadows uh, House of Dark Shadows was uh, an instrumental factor in your yeah. journey as a as a filmmaker and an instrumental yeah. influence as well. What about Night of Dark Shadows? Did you watch that way later, or was that at around the so, same time? Well, that's that's a whole that's a whole kettle of fish right here. So <laughs> Night of Dark Shadows from the cannery from the Collins cannery. All right, exactly. <laughs> cursed from the start so um yeah so i didn't even know there was oh no it, it was it's fleetingly mentioned in um scrapbook memories in the following year night of dark shadows was released but there's nothing about what it's what the plot was or whatnot and then i want to say around the same time that we got house of dark shadows from hollywood video we found night of dark shadows mm -hmm. and i you know i tasted blood and i want more to put rocky horror i've already seen you know <laughs> two-thirds of house so it's like well let's see this one and around the same time i should also add this um they started carrying the mpi videotapes of the show sure so then we were renting the videotapes of the show and i was getting to see the actual show so you're you you and first saw the show through the mpi through, tapes then yeah okay yeah and uh right right after right after seeing house of dark shadows okay. so we're watching the show and it was you know we're all getting into it and whatnot and my mom's all stoked and excited and then there's Night of Dark Shadows there. I find that a Hollywood video. So I'm like, eh, we can get this. And it's not that hard to convince my mom to get this because it's Dark Shadows and she sees David Selby's name is on it. <laughs> so we bring that home. And I remember thinking, and I'm sorry, Dan Curtis. I'm sorry, everybody. But now I love the movie, so I guess it's okay. I remember thinking at the time, this is really boring. 
I'm also like six years old. So what the hell do I really know? It's boring. This is like those PBS dramas that my parents watch. Oh my God. <laughs> what is this good? And then Laura uh, walks down the hallway to attack John Carlin and she's just like the blue phantom. Yeah. And that scared the shit out of me. So then I got rattled and was like, oh my God, what the hell is this? This is crazy. But I didn't really remember much of it because it was just, it's, you know, it's a very quiet film a, sub, a subdued more adult film it's not you know mm-hmm. sledgehammers and gore like house right and at six years old i can comprehend that instead of you know sexual deviancy and rape and all the stuff that is involved in night of dark shadows so anyway Catherine's book uh, dark shadows movie book has photos from night obviously and it has the beautiful poster art that we're both very familiar with yeah. um <laughs> where you know her face is rot. i'm looking at it right now yeah her face is rotting and there's the there's the blue phantom version of laura and she's hanging in coffins and all that and i'm like i don't remember any of this but i know that we watched it um so it's probably like two years later after seeing the videotape so uh we rent it again and this time i like it a little bit more but it still doesn't have the poster it doesn't have the stuff that's yeah. on the poster but then i find out all about the missing footage and what happened to the movie and now my interests really i become far more fascinated by the puzzle box aspect of this film that's been mutilated yeah and where it's where 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 the cuts are Mm -hmm. in the film and trying to unravel this mystery of what the film should have been Sure. So now I become obsessed with the movie and I watch the film over and over and over and over and over and over and study it and try to go online and try to find everything about it. And then I, I'm 10 years old and I, I met Darren online through Dar- his, his Night at Dark Shadows yeah. website. That Darren, Darren Gross, by the Darren way, Gross, yeah. who is yeah. a wonderful guy and a, a legendary figure in the in the Dark Shadows fandom and spearheaded the effort. Spearheading, spearheading. Spearheading, I should say, continues to spearhead the effort to reconstruct Night of Dark Shadows. He located much, uh, not all, but much of the lost footage from Night of Dark Shadows. A lot of it, I think, thirty minutes of it, or at least. Well, I, we can we can go into why because that's because you helped I Darren. Say, you've, you've 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 been helping Darren as well. Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I definitely so, would like to talk about that too. And your poster, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots to talk about here. Yeah, a lot. I told you it's not going to be 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> part three. But anyway, uh, so I become very fascinated by it. And I started emailing Darren at 10 years old and asking him, what does the footage look like? And what does the seance look like? And what is, you know, what does Laura's ghost look like? And all this stuff. And, uh, you know, fast forward to I've made Dr. Mabuse one, I'm in post production on that and Darren knows now I'm not a crazy person because he's been talking to me since I was 10 years old and now I'm 20 Mm -hmm. and I'm like can I just see this footage so he's like all right let's we'll we'll all meet at Laura's that's an appropriate place she's got the portrait hanging and we'll watch the footage so oh that's so cool (laughs) that's what happened and we're all like hanging out at Laura's and there's the portrait from the movie and Darren's there so I finally meet him in person and he pops the DVD in and so you just mentioned yeah Darren found found the footage so let me be very clear because I try to explain this on the internet innumerable times on Facebook and nobody understands. So there is Dan Curtis's original 128 minute preview cut mm-hmm. that he finished and screened for MGM's executives, James Aubrey in particular. So it is Dan Curtis's version. The film plays the way that he wants. There are transitions, there are dissolves, there's all sorts of things that are locked and baked into this 35 millimeter print. And this is what Darren located. The unfortunate aspect is it's missing about, I'm going to say it's, it was, it only had about 15 minutes of the original soundtrack uh, yes, at that yeah. time. At that time. So Darren has in, in intervening since 1999, he has located uh, a couple other sound reels. So we do have a few other scenes now mm-hmm. um, of the original soundtrack Wonderful. from 1971. And Darren has also recorded nearly everybody for the film, all, right. all their missing lines and whatnot. Uh, we recorded John Carlin, a couple missing lines shortly before he died. I, I helped record that. 
that was kind of funny. <laughs> 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 um, and um, we have a Grayson Hall replacement in mind. We've been working on this. We worked on the score with Bob Cobert shortly before he died. We respotted the entire film of where the music should mm-hmm. go. It's really up to Warner Brothers. They control the rights. They control the negative to feel that it is financially viable to basically finish compiling all the elements, pay for the recordings of the Grayson replacement, pay for a cleanup and digital restoration of the 35 millimeter print and release it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot that's happening at Warner's, as we know, they're just, they keep changing, <laughs> you know, uh, guards and merging. And, you know, are we going now to streaming with HBO Max? Is, is they, everybody says it's the death of physical media. Warner has shut down their in-house uh, DVD operations, which is really sad to me because in yeah. the mid 2000s, Warner Home Video was like the gold standard for classic film on DVD. So there's a lot of chess pieces on the board. Who knows? I've been pushing and doing everything I can. In August, it'll be 50 years since the film was released. I feel Dan's vision deserves to be seen just as a filmmaker myself. Um, I've been very, very passionate about it. And it's been a really fun honor working with Darren on the, on trying to get this thing going for as long as it's been going. Like I said, not too long ago, I was eight years old when Darren found this footage yeah. and now I'm 30. You know, yeah. we got to do yeah. something about I, this. I definitely, I, I'd love to get Darren on here at some point. I've yes. been friends with Darren on Facebook for yeah, yeah, yeah. quite a oh, few yeah. years now. And uh, we message each other periodically. And I, I definitely need to reach out to him at some point and have him come yeah. on and talk about to it get, too. He yeah. needs to get this side of the story out there because yeah. this film needs to be seen. And I, so. if there was one, I know when the 2012 Burton film came out, which I want to talk about that too. Uh, when the 2012 Burton film came out, I remember there was a huge sort of expectation at that point yeah. in the fandom that Night of Dark Shadows, the, the restored Night of Dark Shadows would finally be released. And sadly that didn't happen. I'm sure partially yeah. because the film did not do well at the box office. Um, That's so, but, not entirely true. I oh, actually okay happened there. Okay. So it, in 2007, our Warner's, I remember specifically because Warner's used to, Warner Home Video used to have, I want to say it was with the digital bits. They would have a twice a year uh, group chat where they would say, this is what they're working on. And, and people could get in and make requests for classic films that, that, you know, they'd hoped from their catalog to come mm-hmm. to, Del- to DVD. And I remember, cause I, I'm, I'm that weirdo kid that's obsessed with movies uh, being on there. And they said, uh, House of Dark Shadows and Night of Dark Shadows are both coming this fall. And I was like, hell yeah. Yeah, we've took just long, done took long enough for them to release those too. Yeah. yeah, we've just done brand new HD remasters of both titles, uh, so they'll look sparkling new. But it will be the theatrical cut of Night of Dark Shadows. Uh-huh. So this is in 2007. So these HD masters were prepared. And then in 2012, the film, as we know, was supposed to come out. There was a superficial green light to do Night of Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. And then for various internal reasons before the Burton film came out, they said, well, we already have this pre-existing 2007 HD master. So we're just going with that. And so there was a miscommunication. And ultimately, before it was realized, oh, well, we were going to do this too much time, money and, Mm -hmm. you know, corporate effort had been put into this existing 2007 HD master. So that is how that happened. Having said that, there's been a silver lining because the track that they used is a slightly different audio track than was presented on the VHS and Laserdisc. And if you listen to the Night of Dark Shadows Blu-ray or DVD, the audio is god-awful because you're hearing all of the cuts that were where MGM literally took the film and butchered, cut the yeah. film to pieces. So as a result of that, we were able to figure out where some of the music was to go before we spoke with Bob Cobert. There's even a little hints of some of Grayson's dialogue as she's coming back into the gallery at the front. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a, a couple things that Darren and I were able to resolve based off of the sort of miscommunications of the Warner Home Video Department mm-hmm. back in 2007. So, yeah, and there's, I mean, it's every time I, I speak with Jim Pearson, I'm always like, Jim, what are we going to do? How can we get this out there? Mm-hmm. So, is yeah. there, so is there still hope, you think? Yeah, I'm hoping. I mean, yeah. Uh, 
we're, we're still we're still working on experimenting with the sounds and mm-hmm. you know recreating some of the sounds but you know never say never I, we what we need is scream factory to come along or something like that a, a real boutique label that sees the value financial let alone artistic legacy you know to get this film out there the sure. way that dan wanted to see it 50 years after the fact yeah and if yeah MG, for those who may not know you know mgm forced dan curtis to cut james aubrey in particular. yeah james aubrey yeah forced dan curtis to cut a substantial chunk chunks massive chunks of the film it, yeah. out. so it's kind of uh it's, I like Nard of Dark Shadows a lot, but it's definitely uh, n- inconsistent. It's de- it's can be uh, a hard sell for a lot of people to watch Nard of Dark yeah. Shadows because it's it's doesn't make sense without all the, yeah. the pieces that are missing. Like I'd love to see that seance scene. Oh yeah, uh, it was just a pivotal scene. I'd love to see that. And they showed uh, a lot of the footage without the the voice of the track uh, at some of the festivals. And I, mm-hmm. I I I didn't make it to those festivals, so I didn't get to see it. But I'd, at some point, I would certainly most fans I think would love to see the entire uh, yeah. restored footage. How does it sound with the with the actors? You know, it's some quite a bit of time has passed pitching the voices up a little bit or something. And I well, I mean, we I've heard just a little bit of okay. what was kind of done because it's not based like I okay, it's like a it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle and certain yeah. pieces have been placed back in mm-hmm. like but it's not it's not like I sit down and I can watch well, I, I, <laughs> I feel like I can sit down and watch the the movie with all the the audio. The version that I watch around Halloween that I have mm-hmm. is it's got all the music placed back in there it, okay. and some, some shots that are in color and stuff, but it doesn't have all of the re-looped dialogue. Mm-hmm. You know, when we recorded John Carlin, you know, some of his <laughs> lines that we were missing. His voice is his voice a little more gravelly, you know. Yeah. It used to be back then, right? But there's there's very there's, there's a couple of things you can do to just sort of sweeten it out. But for the most part, everybody still sounds like themselves. Sure. I mean, David sounds just like himself. Laura sounds yeah, exactly. Yeah, she like does. Herself, yeah, you, know? you can hear it in the big finish audience yeah. too. You I mean Nancy like, sounds just like yeah. herself? As long as they're, it's their their real essence, and they're they are delivering a genuine performance to their their playback and and whatnot. And and as I said, there's quite a. I was more amazed at how much audio had still existed and there's there's like a scene with grayson that it's originally her audio that oh we have wow it. that's amazing so there's wow. there's a good amount that is that yeah. is there and isn't it's not an entire train wreck it's not an entire lost cause as i sure. see fans you know ignorantly spout on facebook no it's mm. i mean it, we're so close man you know yeah. we're so close yeah we but, gotta as as fans you know if you if you want to see this thing you know you have to be vocal have about to, it uh, I, I tell everybody please write a kind i mean as I as I've already prefaced, everything at Warner's is a bit chaotic at the moment. But sure. they listen to the fans. Release the Snyder Cut work. So why can't yeah. we get this? And it would cost far far less. It's a finished film. You're not doing anything to it. It's a oh, finished film. Yeah. And now I with, tell everybody, with all these streaming platforms too, yeah. there are so many outlets where they could do it. Put it on HBO Max if you don't yeah. want to. You know. But I tell everybody please write a message uh, to the Warner Archive Collection asking for Dane Curtis's original film of Night of Dark Shadows to be released ideally in time for its 50th anniversary, though. Since that's in two months, I know yeah. that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, But, yeah. you know, in an effort for... Mm-hmm. Now, there's also some uh, footage that was cut from House of Dark Shadows. Uh, the, the, in particular, I remember being haunted as a child when I saw the picture of uh, David hanging in the closet where he hung himself to, to trick right. trick Maggie, to torment Maggie. And I believe that was Dan Curtis himself who actually cut that out of the film because it was a bit yeah. too gruesome, I think, for, you know, to, to have that. But that's in, that's long lost, right? I don't yeah, think anybody's that, ever none seen of that. that. Footage, none yeah. of that footage exists. I see on Facebook, people say they saw Nancy Hodiak scene. No, that was never yeah. shot. Yeah. All of the House of Dark Shadows footage was disposed of in New York. Mm-hmm. You never saw it. It does not exist. We've looked. It's mm-hmm. no longer. Night of Dark Shadows, yes, but not House. Thank you for clarifying that, because I know some people do believe that they're, yeah, that's they out there somewhere. You know. Now, one thing before we move on, I want to talk about your Night of Dark Shadows poster, because before, just for listeners, before we started recording, I, you know, we were video chatting and I uh, showed Ansel my reproduction Night of Dark Shadows poster, and he pulls out this amazing <laughs> original poster. Please tell the story. And it's signed by almost every actor who's surviving yeah. actor who was in the film. So t- talk about it. So I was... 
in the 10th grade and my mom and my aunt decided to sell some junk or whatever the hell, I don't remember, at the Pasadena City College flea market and dragged me along. And um, there's a dude that had all these vintage movie posters and me loving classic film. Oh, well, somebody I can talk to. So he and I start talking about movies and one, you know, one film leads to another, leads to another. And you know, we talk about horror movies. And I say, hey, you, you don't happen to have Night of Dark Shadows poster. He goes, actually... And he like, wow, one, two, three, four. And he pulls, you know, it's just in this little cardboard and cellophane case, we're going to call it, mm -hmm. uh, this beautiful hand-rolled one-sheet uh, original Night of Dark Shadows poster that was printed at MGM. And back in the day when these posters would be printed, they'd go through and they'd like take them right off the printing press and select like maybe like 30 or 40 and roll them instead of folding them. Mm -hmm. And this was before the film was even rated. So it's missing the GP sticker. And it's so anyway, it's, a, it's an original rolled mint condition Night of Dark Shadows poster. Yeah, and this that's was, amazing. <laughs> yeah. And he wanted, I think, a couple hundred bucks, for, more than a couple hundred bucks for it. And then I wore him down because I didn't shut up about movies. And then he had the Empire of the Ants press book and say AIP again. And a half sheet for Vincent Price in Confessions of an Opium Eater. And then a lobby card for House of the Damned, which is this 20th Century Fox 1960s Robert Lippert cult film. It's like 60 minute programmer uh, with actually a few cur genuinely creepy moments until the the kind of sad ending. Sorry, I went on a tangent. No, oh, anyway. I, <laughs> no, it's so, great. I, I wore him out just as I'm probably wearing everybody else out listening to me talking about movies and negotiated him, negotiated with him, got this poster down to like 80 bucks and was a very, very happy camper that day. So I was happy that I was driving <laughs> along. That is to such a, what a deal. Wow. Crop at the flea market. $80. And $80 and you, for this hand rolled <laughs> yeah, original. And, yeah. And you have all the surviving actors autographs on it, except for who? So, okay. So then, so then when I'm filming... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm filming Dr. Mabuse one and I bring it to set and I'm like, Laura, will you sign this for me? And so she signed it. She was the first one to sign it. She's Angelique, she's right here. It's just yeah. like, love and curses always to Wonderful. Angel Laura Parker. <laughs> and then we did the second one, and Chris Panic was um yeah one of i'm not going to call him one of the villains but he's one of the antagonists mm -hmm. in dr mabuza etio pomar the second dr mabuza film mm -hmm. and so he i brought it again he signed it <laughs> and then um it's just the two ansel thank you for the great part chris pennock because mm -hmm. for the when we were shooting the film um and he was Professor Conrad, it's named after Marshall Jones's character in Scream and Scream again. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I had uh, John Carlin sign it when we were hanging out because we went to lunch a couple times and he was hysterical. Oh my oh, God. Everybody loved John Carlin. I John just... Carlin would say the craziest <laughs> and was witty and smart and did not give a damn and <laughs> made it even funnier because he didn't give a damn and tell it like it is. Yeah. Such a cool guy. Oh my God. So he, he signed it for me and he's like, I can't believe I'm signing this goddamn thing. <laughs> like, I'm so happy right now. <laughs> this is hi, Ansel John Carlin and really shaky Sharpie, but it was just thrilling. Yeah. And Storm signed it for me. Um, oh, Bob Colbert signed it for me. There's a, somebody got a photo of me having him sign it and he put some musical notes on it. Mm -hmm. And then Great. And then, so here's here's the uh, to conclude. I don't have Nancy's signature. I really need Nancy's. Nancy Barrett. Yeah. Need Nancy Barrett, and I technically need Kate Jackson's signature. Oh right, but, yeah. But I think Nancy's might be a little easier to manage. But then we were we were so David is is going to do Loon Lake, right? So uh, <laughs> it's like a month before we're going to Minnesota, and we're doing costume fittings, and I have one of two options. I either haul this poster with me in the car across the country to Minnesota from California. Mm -hmm. And at some point in the chaos of filmmaking, have him autograph this and make sure that it's remained safe and not damaged and then haul it back across the country or just bring it with me to the Valley when we're doing our costume fittings mm -hmm. and Kelly Kitko, who's, who's Mary Jane in the film. And she's one of the producers of Loon Lake. Mm -hmm. she's there for the costume fitting and i show up and i've got this poster she's like oh for sake you did not i'm like i'm sorry i want him to sign this poster that i this is my this is my childhood thing here man and david laughed hysterically when i unfurled this after he's tried on all of his pastor jansen outfits and emery the farmer outfits i'm like david i got one more thing for you to do 
and he's expecting it's some th- something to do with Loon Lake or some paperwork or whatnot. And I'm like, can you sign this for me? And he's <laughs> he's only too happy to and to Ansel with yeah. gratitude, David Selby, and it's above oh, his name on the poster. So that's great. That's my poster story. Wonderful, stories. wonderful. Okay, so that's awesome. That's so cool. Uh, I hope you get. I hope you get Nancy's and Kate Jackson's at, yeah. at some point. That would be amazing. You got to get yeah. Kate. She was the. She was the lead. You know, I know. Her, her, I know. Or, or one of the leads. You know, her, David, and yeah. uh, and Lara. Um, now we talk a lot about about the films here, and you you mentioned that you just you also watched the the television series on MPI Home Video, and then you mm-hmm. also mentioned watching the reruns on the Sci Fi Channel. So what yeah. did you also become a fan uh, of the TV show itself, or is it primarily the films? That it, that you're a fan of? Well, I think I mean the whole thing is incestuous, isn't it? You know, <laughs> yeah. Like just quote, you know, Roger. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Our ancestors are very. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, but I mean that where I came at it was through the films. Sure. And then, but as I as I already said, you know, my mom was telling me the various storyline arcs. I remember I remember her telling me, and then they had. The thing in the box in the basement, which turned out to be Chris Panic. So it's just, oh, again, sure. like, yeah. <laughs> and then he's here for Thanksgiving. Um, so I I was familiar with the whole world and stuff. So it's it's like seeing, I said, the, the bedtime story come to life and watching the show and sure. and watching, I remember, you know, the, the the conclusion to 1795 and, you know, Vicky's getting hung and, and the whole sort of that exhilarating feeling of that storyline um, yeah. as a kid on videotape. So I, I was just sort of, it's like, it's all, it's all dark shadows. It's all Collins for it, you know? So mm-hmm. I was just a fan of the whole thing. I, I, I will say I'm not where like, cause I know there are some people that are, uh, they know it forwards and backwards and every mm-hmm. single episode and who was on what episode and when right. and where, and why they were off that week. Or I, I'm not like that. I can't do right. that. Maybe with the films, but not with the show. More of but more I, of the storylines and and yeah, I, I I I'm well versed. I mean, I I know the world and stuff, but I'm not mm-hmm. a bibliophile like like that. Sure. But then I saw on you know Sci Fi Channel was where I saw the later parts of the show where they really got weird and, and <laughs> psychedelic and you know staircase through time and parallel times and and uh, you know like I said the really mm-hmm. weird trippy stuff that everybody seems to like ignore and discount and just focus on Barnabas. Mm-hmm. But I love that. I think that's. I mean, Judah Zagger, you brought it up. I'm like, that's yeah. that's where I was watching all that and mm-hmm. the green flag and Gerard and all that. Sure, yeah. Rose Cottage. So I was. I I kind of dig all of it. Um, mm-hmm. I'll even dig, you know, Bromwell and Catherine. Right. Right. So in the, the lottery room, the curse yeah, lottery room. It's all. Yeah. <laughs> it's all. I mean, you just kind of want to be in that that weird world and and those hallways and. Mm-hmm stormy windows and all of that. Totally. Yeah. I think yeah. by, by then, uh, well, we know that the last year of the show was not aired in syndication. Um, you know, the cut where I was watching it in syndication on uh, channel 58 out of uh, Vineyard Haven on UHF, they cut it off right in the midst of parallel time, like right mm-hmm. in the middle of that storyline. So they kind of leave you like many, most episodes Dang. and on a cliffhanger. Yeah. So it was like yeah. Horace Gladstone, I think, you know, announced to Cyrus Longworth that he knew he was John Yeager you know, the Jekyll mm. and Hyde. And it was like, yeah, yeah. then it's like, oh no, it's over. Like, well, I can't watch what, what happens what's, next. What's you know? going to happen to Chris now? Yeah. 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 So <laughs> uh, it's like, no, uh, but I think now that we, you know, the show has been out for a while, people have rediscovered that and, and the pre Barnabas oh, yes. episodes too. And certainly, you know, Barnabas has earned his place as a, as a pop culture icon, that storyline mm-hmm. just catapulted the, the show into, into the stratosphere. The Abso- the absolutely. Now to me, I, I have a similar story in the sense that my uncle Valdemar. Oh my God, what a great name. Isn't it right? It's of Uncle Valdemar. We call him Uncle Val, but his, his actual name is Valdemar. And he kind of does look like Valdemar Daninsky from, you know, from Ashy <laughs> Carrick. He looks a little, oh, I've mind, never seen him during a full to, moon. <laughs> my mind went to uh, Vincent Price melting in Tales of Terror, the facts. Right. Oh, the K- M. Valdemar. <laughs> oh, and my uncle loves the fact that there is an Edgar Allan Poe story with his name in the title. <laughs> <laughs> I remember he pointed it out to me. He introduced me to Poe too. He gave me a book of Poe tales. With a name like that, you have to. Yeah, That's oh, it's just totally. a cool last name. 
Oh yeah. Um, and he was the, he was the, the, the one who introduced me to dark shadows from, I don't remember a time when I didn't know what dark shadows was because of uncle. Same. Al. And yeah. Same. And he, yeah. And it was like, you said with the bedtime stories really resonated with me because yeah. he would, I would ask him tons of questions about the yeah. show and like yeah. and what happened next and what happened. And he would tell me from his yeah. memories, which were spotty, yeah. but I remember him telling me, and there's a room that leads to another time when they go in the room, they go, right. they go to another time. And I kept like these moments that he would mention. I would keep waiting to see. Right, right, right. Yeah. You're like, what, what is that? What does that mean? What does that look like? How do they, right. how are they going to do that? And then right. you see it. And right. it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> yes, right. And he's like, oh, and Quentin is a werewolf, turns into a werewolf. And I'm in the first time you see Quentin, it's it's he's Peter Quint. He's like he's, he's the ghost, the turn of the screw. And it's like, wait, I thought he was a werewolf, but he's a ghost. Wait, but then okay, now we're seeing his life. Wait, now he's a zombie. Now he's you know, that he's a werewolf. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to see to see how those moments would come into existence right, before you right. rest. Definitely. It's almost like uh passing along these these stories to you know, the fairy around tales. The campfire. Yeah, it's ghost totally. around the campfire. Yeah. That's so so that's like I mean when you said what Quentin turned into a werewolf, like my whole thing was, what does she look, what is the cliff, what Widow's Hill when she jumps? What does Josette, mm. you know, how, what does that, what does that yeah. look like? Yeah. And yeah. so I was totally fully expecting that to happen in House of Dark Shadows as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I remember it didn't happen and I was kind of disappointed. I mean, he mentions it, you know, when yeah. he's talking to Willie, but it didn't happen. And I, I was like, well, but I wanted to see that. That sounds yeah. so cool. Yeah. And, and it sounds so cinematic too, you know? <laughs> and then, and then it happened on the show and I, it, as we know, you don't, you know, there is no cliff. Right. Um, it's Catherine just kind of goes off camera and you hear it. And what, yeah. And it, but it was still, oh, that, still was, that was the it's, moment. Yeah. That yeah. was the moment. Uh, there, I didn't get to see the cliff. And then, you know, there's the 91 show where they do it again. And I know because they shot the show in uh, Greystone, Doheny Mansion. Oh, Greystone. Beverly yeah. Hills. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so I did when I was in the eighth grade, I did my own, my own Night of Dark Shadows. And that's actually uh-huh. where Madame LeSeur originated. It was uh, oh. the taking of Samantha Brennan. It was, it's basically yeah. Night of Dark Shadows. So I, mm-hmm. my two friends move into Greystone Manor. It's haunted by a girl that was probably a witch. Night of Dark Shadows events happen. A, mm-hmm. The psychic comes in who was Madame Lesseur, who then later on is theater fantastic. And um, there's a skeleton. I, ter- I took uh, my aunt and uncle's shower and turned it into like a secret chamber mm-hmm. and made the door into an iron door. And we had bricks and then they had to, you know, wow. tear the bricks down to find the skeleton because you know, that's mm-hmm. a lost scene. And we never got to see that. And I was obsessed with it at the time. Anyway, I'll shut up. Uh, no, and no. I know in Greystone where they filmed the the fake widow's hill that Josette jumps off in that. So that was, I got to see that as a kid. I'm like, ah, oh, that's cool. cool. There's the cliff. Yeah. And then they really did it in the Burton film. And I thought that was a great moment. And then it went off that's, the rail. That's but. the thing with the Burton film. Uh, it's that beginning, I think works quite well with the uh with the train coming and the night yeah. white satin playing yeah. and then and then the, the the scene with with josette jumping off the cliff and then it just yeah. nose dives into this austin powers fish out of water uh yeah as soon as as soon comedy. as they're at mcdonald's site, uh oh that was awful site, it's yeah. then it, it just it, yeah. it goes it does it the mephistopheles and somebody asked me uh i was going to save this for the for the email episode but is there anything nice i have to say about the timber <laughs> and i do <laughs> there are some things i like yeah. about it a few things yeah. one thing i actually which is seems like a very shallow thing to say but or surface thing but Johnny Depp did keep the hair with the pointy bangs. No yeah. other version of Barnabas did the bangs. All Ben Cross and uh, the Alec the, Newman, the Alec Newman yeah, yeah. and the pilot. Nobody did the bangs, and Johnny sure. Depp kept the bangs. Sure. So that's pretty cool. Like he, he was true to the look of it, and he did a pretty good impression of the cadence of Jonathan Fred, but just the the tone yeah. of the of the film. My my concern with that film, which I will reiterate, and I I did have a couple of run-ins with people who were not happy with how I phrased it. I was polite about how I phrased it, but my this thing that made me sad about that film, if it if it had been a success in sort of the pop culture world, mm-hmm. that film would have rewritten what Dark Shadows was in the minds of people who were vaguely maybe aware of what the original show was or had never seen it. And if that had been a hit, that would have then sort of overwritten, I think, what Dark Shadows is. It never will. I mean, the original is, is certainly a classic, but yeah. my fear is like, if you take something and completely alter the tone of, of what uh, the source material is, then it no longer is the source material. 
material. It's exactly. simply a parody of it. And that's, exactly. I have, I take issue with that. And I think particularly a lot of people felt betrayed because uh, Burton and Depp both professed for years to be fans of the original show. I remember reading an article, an interview yes. with Tim Burton. He said, oh, that show pounded a nail into my brain when I was a kid. And yeah. Depp saying he always wanted to play Barnabas Collins. And I'm not saying they're not fans. I'm sure that Warner Brothers, from uh, what I understand, involved themselves in the process. Um, they revisited the vampire thing and said, well, no, there are so many vampire shows now. We have to alter the tone of the So I'm sure there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen there. Yeah, and it's, it's a shame. A, yeah. So what happened with that? Also, I mean, you know, I grew up with Edward Scissorhands, so I grew up in the prime of Tim Burton filmmaking and and loving. Oh, I love the you know, original stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I sleep everything pretty much up to Sleepy, even after Sleepy, Home, even after yeah. is a is yeah. a masterpiece. Sweeney Todd is fantastic. I wanted to go to Cal Arts so badly when I was in school because that's where Tim Burton went to, to college. Yeah, yeah. And I did not get in. They was like, we can't teach you anything. You're, you're better off not coming. And I'm like, it was really disappointing. But I was so excited when they said they're going to do this as a film. What happened? Uh, well, let me let me I'll speak to my half. The cast was perfect. They had a perfect cast all around. Michelle Pfeiffer remember, was great, by the way. I thought Michelle Pfeiffer was fantastic. When, I remember when because when it was when when they said, OK, now we're finally going to film it, you know, after announcing it in 2007 and they started announcing the cast and, uh, you know, we knew Johnny was going to be Barnabas, but they said Evergreen. And I'm like, oh, that's a mm -hmm. perfect choice. Michelle Fife, perfect choice. Jackie Earl Haley is Willie. I'm like, oh, my God. Yes. Brilliant. Uh, Helena, we knew she was going to be in there somewhere. And she, she's perfect as Julia. Like, that's a great casting choice. That first cast photo, when it came out, I could not have been more excited. Same. same. I was like, yep. they look right. The cut, they even got the green tinge, you know, like that's, they even got that. Yes. I was excited yeah. when I saw that picture too. It yeah. was, I was like, oh my gosh, that this yeah. is awesome. It's going it's to yeah. be good. It's going to be good. And then you're hearing like Warner's wants this to be their next Harry Potter and Sherlock Holmes. They're wanting mm -hmm. Dark Shadows 2, 3, and 4. This is going to be a thing. No trailer, no trailer, no trailer, no trailer, no trailer for months. The trailer came out and I was like, uh, okay, I get it because I understand how marketing works. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just what it is. Having said that, the cinematography was beautiful. I love. Yes. Oh my God. I'm blanking on his name, but I love him. I, he's such, he's a great photographer. I remember he shot also Harry Potter and the, or, um, and the half blood prince. Okay. I remember in yeah. the theater for that thinking, Oh my God, I love the photography. He's a great it look, photographer. It looks great. I like all like yeah. Burton films look good. All, most Burton yeah. films look good. You know, they look great. The Colin would look like Colin. Yeah, the like the exterior. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Colin's port. They built the yes. damn town. Like yeah. there was so much going for it. The cast is perfect, and I put all the blame on Seth Graham Smith. Seth Graham uh, Smith and Richard yeah. Zanuck, because Richard Zanuck is the one that said, "Let's make it funny." Because and Richard Zanuck was, is is a producer, right? He was or, he was executive? the producer. He's yeah. Daryl Zanuck's son, and he ran yeah. Fox for a moment and he okay. produced major film stuff. It was his. It was like final film as producer too. But True Blood was on. We had Twilight. We had lead. There's yeah. There was a, an onslaught of vampire. Mm -hmm. uh, film and television and serious vampire film and television. And he was the one that said, oh, let's make it funny. Ugh. So I blame him. And then I blame Seth Graham Smith because Seth Graham Smith, no, you're not a writer. And I just said that. And I don't mind saying that you, you, there are so many problems in the structure of that film and so much uncalled for crudeness is what I'll say. And uh, I just, I, it just, as you can tell, <laughs> yeah, no, but, uh, I was sitting in the theater because we went to the, the Vista premiere, the 20, you know, they yeah. showed house and they showed, and it's happening. And then she goes, get, Bart, you know, Julia goes down. On, oh, went, what an awful, what scene. is, what an awful, what has scene. happened? Yeah. What happened here? My, that's yeah. That, that made I me mean, really sad. It kept yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, Alice Cooper was great. Yeah. That was, that Alice was Cooper cool. was great, but. I still feel I love Alice Cooper. I've, I saw him perform uh, live at the Cape Cod Melody Tent when he sang Poison. He pointed at me. I was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I feel that he's uh, out of place in a film in a Dark Shadows film because Dark Shadows sort of almost is hermetically it, sealed. It's exists in its own world yes. and it rarely makes references to it never makes to references to pop culture. You know, yeah. so having Alice Cooper as a real life sort of celebrity playing himself, it felt weird. 
to me. It didn't did not resonate with me. I, I love Alice. I, it was cool I, seeing him. But. Yeah, <laughs> I totally get where you're getting at that from because it, it is a hermetically sealed world. We're not concerned about Vietnam. We're not concerned about the hippie movement. We're not mm. concerned about LSD, even if, you know, Chris might be tripping as he's, you mm. know, raising the dead as he's shooting it. You know, it's its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't mind. I thought it was, yeah. I thought he was, I thought the soundtrack was cool. I mean, mm -hmm. I liked all the songs, you know, mm -hmm. it's, but it, the script, yeah. the script is. And, yeah. and of course, the original uh, script from I, which I would love to read, it was ostensibly was a sort of a godfather like epic, gothic epic uh, with Barnabas uh, at the at the head of it. And that original script, I, for, I forget who the screenwriter John August. John August. Thank you. I wonder what that would have been like, like what that have you ever met, seen that script? I've, well, so I've heard about that. I remember hearing that, too, that yeah, it was like the godfather. And I was like, oh, man, what did we miss out on? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I might be wrong. I might be wrong here. But I, I've heard that that script still was not quite as... I think that we would have still been kind of like shocked by I, I, okay by what it would have been. I also think it's the same plot line as what we got. Okay. Seth Graham Smith used the same plot beats, but... I heard so that like Angelique running the, the taking over the can doing the Burke Devlin plot basically yeah, yeah, yeah. like that the competing was... cannery and and stuff. Yeah, but I've I've heard that it was still yeah. that it, and also that it was like an R-rated film, okay. um, but it was still would have been a bit different okay. from the Dark Shadows that we know. Now that might have been a good thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what it needs is a revitalization. I mean, House of Dark Shadows is totally different from mm -hmm. the show. Right. I think so, as long as the tone is consistent with the tone of what dark, yeah. what we know dark i think even though house of dark shadows is more uh, violent it's still a gothic horror film like you can still point to yeah. that and say this is this is what this is it's and, a more violent and the characters version. for the most part are still true to who they are sure the yeah part. barnabas is not talking about birthing hips or julia's not going no. down on barnabas and, and things no. like that and then i think what happened well, david saying carolyn is playing with herself like yeah yeah no, no no and then i think after that came out and fans reacted badly to it uh understandably so i think it added fuel to the fire when tim burton and uh, Helena Bonham Carter said some awful things about the original show, which was very disappointing. And then Tim Burton also kind of pointed the finger of blame uh, at the original show. And as a fan of the show, he should, I think he should have not said that, you know, he, yeah. he could have, he it's could like have chosen had a bad script. You're working yeah. off of a bad script that, yeah. you know. Yeah. But he, of course, he's not. Working off of a 1966 yeah. episode. Like, right. Seth right. Graham Smith wrote that for you. So that's yeah, probably. Sure. So, but it, it was what it was. And hopefully we'll, we will see uh, more Dark Shows. There's the reincarnation uh, yes. show, which yes. was supposed to, was on the way, which that intrigued me because I think I'm good with seeing another revisiting it is still it is still on the way. That project, okay. everybody is, says it's dead. No, they're wrong. Yes, it's I heard you say that in, in the uh, in the Halloween uh, get together. Yeah, t talk about that. So, have you heard? What have you heard about that? What can I, you say? <laughs> <laughs> um, it is no not, pressure. It is not dead. <laughs> okay, it good. Is still, everybody behind it is very enthusiastic and passionate about it mm -hmm. and pushing for it. It's being shopped around still. Okay. I also will say from what was described to me by the people in charge, I was very, very happy as a, oh, as okay. a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so I, this is Dark Shadows is the show that will never die. We all know that. Mm -hmm. I am confident at some point Dark Shadows reincarnation will happen. Mm -hmm. And I think it will be a lot of fun and yeah. very honoring to what has come before it's 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 could be really cool. It could be really cool. Well, I think the fact that they want to do a sequel series to Dark Shadows is the right yeah. way to go, because I think I'm good with just retelling the same story, um, yeah. doing a next generation like they did with Star Trek to, exactly. to, to great success, I might add, exactly. is the way to go. Like having an, exactly. adult, an adult David and an older Carolyn or something, whatever they're, they're mm. going to do. And the sort of the new generation of Collinses and with, you know, the portrait of Elizabeth uh, uh, and 
Roger on the wall and things like that. That yeah. is exciting to to, and, to and, watch and that, you know. Just <laughs> also like the world that that you get to play around in. Sure, um, all, all the, the backstories, the threads the they can thing, pull from. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's. I'll shut up. I shall. I, sh- I no. shall say anymore. <laughs> well, I don't want to get you in. We're not so, getting Ansel in trouble it here. It's so like, cool. But I think you've said so what cool. you've said is is tantalizing, and let's hope that it's just honoring. Will, it's very. Yeah. It's very honoring, and I know yeah. Dan's daughters are very pleased with it and Mm -hmm. i think everybody when this thing happens i think everybody would be very pleased with it it's not dead don't believe the internet don't believe all these random i see it all the time on like e Mm -hmm. news or something oh the the pilot Uh that's that got killed no it's yeah it's still pumping hey uh you know netflix there are people at netflix friends with one of them who is a dark shadows fan by the way and i know netflix would be a great yeah i know this be a great outlet for it. Uh, now, I want to ask you another question before I want I talk to you about working with the Dark Shadows actors and influences of Dark Shadows on other horror films, etc. We're similar in that we both come from a background of enjoying horror films and horror literature and just th- that genre terror, perhaps. I, I, like mm-hmm. Boris Karloff would call it terror. And there yes, is a distinction. Yes. Yeah, there is definitely a distinction between between horror and uh, and terror, as Anne, Anne Radcliffe pointed out. But with Dark Shadows, I find there are definitely Definitely groups of fans, like some fans come at it from being fans of soap operas more so than yeah. classic horror. Like uh, Danny Horn has a wonderful blog where he actually, you know, pulls in the history of Dark Shadows and mixes information into his sort of reviews of the episodes, which can sometimes be a bit uh, flippant, I suppose. But he's he's certainly very intelligent and articulate in his write ups and uh, they're enjoyable. But he is a huge uh, soap opera fan. I think he likes monster movies, but he's coming at it from a soap opera perspective. Perspective. Whereas when I came to Dark Shadows, it was definitely from, I didn't even know Dark Shadows was a soap opera. And I have nothing against soap operas. I remember right. watching all my children with my mom and my grandmother. It's like, I have nothing against soap operas. I think of it as it's a serialized narrative uh, story, but I don't really think of it so much as a soap opera, particularly once it got into the supernatural stuff. Yeah. And as Danny points out in his blog, you know, everything's a soap opera now, Game of Thrones and yeah. uh, all of these shows, Breaking Bad all of this stuff, they're all kind of soap operas in the sense that they are serialized narratives. Now, let me ask you a question. Where do you place Dark Shadows? Like if we, you can't really categorize Dark Shadows. It's a dark fantasy, terror, gothic romance is in there. But if, if somebody said, let's imagine video stores were back in existence. Okay. And somebody. Oh, I wish. Oh, I, I wish. know. I know. Right. And I'm working at my room. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, you you guys could see this. Ansel's room looks like not blockbuster video. That's too corporate. This looks like one of those cool video stores. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Like there was a place in San Francisco, Leather Tongue Video, and it was just all cult movies and crazy stuff. Great, great store. But I have somebody handed me some tapes of Dark Shadows and they said, go put them on the shelves. And I'm looking at one shelf and I see Journal Hospital, One Life to Live and All My Children. And I look at another shelf and I see Doctor Who. Star Trek and the Universal Monster series, I look at the cover of the Dark Shadows tape. I'm going to go put it on the, the shelf with Doctor Who, Star Trek and the, and the like Twilight Zone and the Universal. Yeah, Monster. I was going to say, I you was know, gonna that's say where I'm going to put it. Or a night gallery too. And night, oh, of course, yeah, night Brewer, gallery night for gallery. sure. Oh, for sure. Where would you put it? Like, that's where I would put it. But other fans may put it on the General Hospital, One Life to Live, on my children's shelf. Maybe there's a shelf in the middle. I don't know. No, it's, I mean, that's just so funny because I used to, I, oh my God, I'm a terrible person. I used to go into Hollywood video and mm-hmm. grab all of the Universal Monster <laughs> classic collection videotapes, you know, with the nice artwork. Yeah, yeah. And in the horror video section, because that's where they were, and reorganized them so they were all together. So all mm-hmm. the like the cover art was uniform every Friday. And I'm sure the Hollywood video staff hated me because I totally f***ed up their, their <laughs> system of, of <laughs> cataloging. But I would put Dark Shadows. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to put it in the horror section. Mm-hmm. Goth. I mean, it, it is gothic. I mean, how I've organized my room. Well, I've got my Dark Shadows tapes and all my Dan Curtis stuff right next to Kolchak and Night Gallery right. and Thriller. So yeah. it's all, it's going to be horror television, right. but horror. Right. Um, it's even when in, you know, the, the pre-Barnabas episodes, like that's all film noir. 
Oh yes, yes. You know, and it's gothic not, romance. It's like it's yeah. like Bronte it's, meets yeah, film noir. noir. Really? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Val Luton, really. Val Luton. Oh and, yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not you know it's not like Young and the Restless and all that. It just happens to be on videotape at four o'clock in the afternoon. Right. I think because Curtis, he, he originally pitched this as a primetime series, yeah. and and they wanted to, ABC wanted to put it on in the daytime, and then Dan Curtis kind of did what he, he wanted with it. With it. He rolled yeah. with it, and I think it, they're the legacy of sort of the. Again, the Penny Dreadfuls, you know, I mentioned mm -hmm. when I was talking yeah. with Jeff, they, that was yeah. also serialized narrative. Comic books are serialized narrative. I, and again, they're all soap operas. It depends. I guess it depends how you define soap opera to me. Go, growing up, I always thought of soap operas as this. lots of double talk and don't go and oh, but you're going to leave me. And oh, she's having an affair, which is all in Dark Shadows. <laughs> it, it all is in there, too. So there is that there is that aspect as well. So it's the show that will not be categorized, I guess, yeah. because that is in there, too. It's its own sure. hermetically sealed, weird little thing. Thing yeah, in the box and theater, <laughs> like live theater, like that's totally true. Totally, true. a lot of that going on. All right, so moving on. Okay, I want to ask you about your experiences with working with the Dark Shadows actors. Like, it's so exciting to like all of a sudden I see Lisa Richards in one of your films. Yeah. Oh, Lisa Richards, holy moly! Or Chris Penn. I, I I teared up when I watched the the most haunted house in Venice Beach. That that scene, that last scene yeah. with him where he's yeah. delivering the Shakespeare monologue. So that was yeah. that was actually the last thing he ever filmed. No kidding. That, oh my goodness. How poignant. Wow. That's the last bit of acting Chris did. Um, oh shot my that. goodness. Wow. In September 17th, mm -hmm. last year, 2020, he was going through therapy for his illness um, and was in Santa Monica for treatment. And he's originally, uh, some of that was um, socially distanced shot. So, so mm -hmm. some of the actors would film themselves for me remotely and then send me the footage. Doug Eames as the Speedway Ghost is an example. The Daryl from Loon Lake, he plays Abbott the ghost of Ab Kinney. He shot his footage in Minnesota for me and sent it to me. So Chris was going to just shoot his stuff in Idlewilds where he lived. And then he's like, I'm coming to Santa Monica. I'll just come over. And I'm like, <laughs> great. You know, I haven't seen you in a bit, but come on over. So he came over brief afternoon. He did his thing. I mean, you know, Chris always knew exactly what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. I could tell he was a bit more. <sighs> Chris was, is, was like electricity, you know, mm -hmm. there's just power, you know, and I could see that there was the electric spark was something was wrong. Was, yeah. Yeah. Electricity is not as vibrant. So I was a bit worried and I knew that he wasn't doing too well, but he won't, you know, he's, he's bored like the rest of us, like Jerry was when we did the, the Dr. Mabuza short and earlier mm -hmm. in the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wrote him, you know, the role that's, I mean, it's not even, it's not even, honestly, it's not even a role. It's Chris. That <laughs> character is Chris. <laughs> He is Chris. He's like, I am this guy. And I'm like, I know. Man. <laughs> so, the, and I mean, the, the ending, um, it's ironic because it's, I mean, the film is about memory and film is about a place lost in time, the old Venice Beach. Yeah. Um, and what better people to tell you that history, the, the sort of, and it's all true history. You know, I mean, now that house is real. The house is not haunted. I don't know mm -hmm. who lives there. But the the stories that the ghosts are relating are all truth. Uh, so I, I'm like, I'm writing this thing about ghosts. Now I need to tie this up. What better way to tie this up than with the Tempest? We are but stuff that dreams are made of. Right. So I wrote that for Chris to say, because he's, you know, the big Shakespearean actor on, on set. Right. And that was the last thing that he did, because that's because we shot in order of, I mean, it's wow. like a documentary. So I'm shooting. All right, Chris, so this is your first bit. He does his in order. And then we come to the end and he does his Shakespearean monologue. And then that was it. That was oh literally the last thing wow. that Chris performed. I, 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 I got goosebumps and, and I, uh, you know, I teared up watching that. If, um, if you haven't seen in the, this, uh, listeners, please look it up. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can watch it yeah. for free. Uh, it's the yeah. most haunted house in Venice beach and it's yep. Hollinsworth productions. The YouTube page and many of Ansel's films are on there, but that, that scene with, with Chris Pennock was just really amazing. Uh, and just, yeah. he was in, in that film too. Um, now you worked with several of the other dark shadows actors. I mentioned at the top of the show, Catherine Lee Scott, Larry. Parker, mm -hmm. we talked about David Selby, Jerry Lee. So what was that like? I mean, having done many appearances at cons uh, as Penny Dreadful and, and <laughs> a lot of people and stuff and just hamming it up. I get excited. 
Yeah, I met uh, Sharon uh, Smith, uh, in fact, and she uh, she was Sharon Smith Lentz at uh, Coast City Comic Con. I saw she was a guest. This was up in Portland, Maine. I when I went up, approached her, and I was in my, <laughs> my penny get up, and my late husband was in his guru wear Wolfman costume. And right. um, I don't get uh, nervous when I meet celebrities. Right. I I just don't. But the Dark Shadows people, I can't. I can't, I just get so. But I you know I mustered up my courage and I approached her and I I said you know I I said I am a huge Dark Shadows fan and I loved you in Dark Shadows and I said you are the guest I was most excited to meet at the <laughs> show like I was so thrilled and she was the nicest person and is the nicest person she is okay. the nicest person we friended each other on Facebook and she just such a good hearted friendly warm person and I was delighted yeah. delighted to meet her and I think it's just this fear I have like what if I meet one of the, the actors they're not friendly to me and that'll, that'll really hurt my feelings because I I really admire their no, they're all acting nice. and they're all great. I, I, that's the sense I get from interviews I've seen with them. Oh, yeah. I met, I'm at the, even at the festival, I met very briefly, I met Lara Parker and she was very friendly and I met oh, yeah. John Carlin. I was in the elevator with my husband, with John Carlin. And, uh, I was like, I, he walks into the elevator and all I could say was, hi. And he goes, hey, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> that was it. I didn't say anything else. And I was like, damn it. I had the chance to like talk to John oh, yeah. Carlin. And all I could say oh, was, hi. For some reason, I get like butterflies or something. But so, but it doesn't sound like you had that experience. You went right for oh, the. Oh, no, I did. Oh, my God. I totally yeah. did. Oh, you oh, did. God. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I was I'm like 19 years old and now I have to like direct them. So, no, it's, it was terrifying. But mm-hmm. I mean, so. The first celebrity that I uh, encountered was Lyndon Childs, Mm -hmm. um, who, if anybody is listening, watched anything of television from literally the dawn of television to Mm -hmm. 2003. You more than likely have seen Lyndon in everything. Because he was in everything. He worked for everybody. He was even, he worked for Hitchcock on, in Marnie. He did, did everything. So I was 17. When I met him, started directing him. And that was really scary because I'm like, this guy was directed by Hitchcock. You know, he, he knows, you know, and I'm a kid in a garage with a peanut for a camera and no mic. But then I started to learn how to speak to actors and kind of what yeah. directing an actor was versus directing my junior high, high school friends who are not actors who could not give a damn about acting. And, mm-hmm. and you're sort of like forcing something out of them to fit what you've got in your head. So I learned quite a bit from Lyndon. I'm very grateful to Lyndon. Uh, and he's in Dr. Mabuza One. He's he's um, Inspector Von Bank. That's the mentor to Inspector Loman. I mean, then he brought it. We brought him back from the grave for yeah. <laughs> for the Thousand and One Lives. Yes, Dr. yeah, it was so great and, that he was in that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was trippy. Um, and he'd been he'd been he thought that he would have thought that was be hysterical to to be <laughs> acting beyond the grave. But anyway, um, so Dr. Mabuza One, I emailed Catherine. And spoke with her in email correspondence. And then I was casting the film in Hollywood. And she said, well, I'll come and meet you. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And she read this. I mean, she'd read the script then. And I'm 90% certain that she didn't believe that I'd written it. Especially when she like walks in the door and here's this shy, terrified, little misfit kid <laughs> sitting behind the desk. And she just like looks at me really weirdly like, what is going on here? And then start asking me questions and I'm like, I'm freaking out, but doing my best to seem like a professional film director, you know, at 19. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I remember one of the questions she asked in the, in the, in the first Mabuza film, there's three of them. So this is much of a spoiler alert. In the, in the first one, <laughs> she jumps from a building. And she's like, so how are you going to do that? Because I've already jumped once before. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, my God, that's so cool. <laughs> um, and I'm like, well, you're going to be standing on an apple crate. And it'll be about yay high. And then you'll just kind of step off and you'll you'll bow, but it'll look like you're jumping. And I answered enough of her questions because, I mean, I knew what I wanted and I knew how to speak mm-hmm. um, that she was like, OK. And who are you thinking about my psychic sister? And I'm like, well. Laura Parker. <laughs> and she's like, but I'm like, but I don't know how to contact her. She's like, let me see what I can do. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and um, so then I had sent scripts out, or I, I didn't send, I'm sorry. I pitched the film. I pitched the role of Mabuza to Jerry. I found his contact on Facebook, which is yeah. always dubious. <laughs> um, and I had messaged him, never heard anything. Tried a few other genre icons, didn't hear anything. 
Uh, actually, no, one actor was very kind to me and wrote back to me. Actually, a, a well-known cult figure uh, wrote back to me, was very kind to me and explained to me why he couldn't do the film at the time. But it was very nice. So that's nice. <laughs> um, and then out of nowhere, and so I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to have to just get like some random actor. I have to cast it. And then randomly I go on Facebook and there's a message from Jerry Lacey. And so I just saw this message in my thing. I never come on here and I don't know what you're doing or whatnot, but this sounds intriguing. This is my email. Oh my God. So I email him and I explain him the project in an email and he says, okay, well send me the script. And I sent him, you know, a 102 page screenplay that I had basically written when I was about 15 years old. And then, so then he, he emails me and he goes, I'd like to speak with you. What's your number? What's your phone number? And I gave him my phone number. I didn't hear anything. And then that night, my phone, my cell phone rings and Humphrey Bogart's voice is on the other end of my phone. <laughs> <laughs> freaking out <laughs> and he's like well i thought this was going to be like a short like 10 minutes and i wasn't expecting a hundred some pages i'm fascinated by this thing and i'm sort of familiar with the character and i i know more about dr caligari than dr mabuza and then he goes so um convince me and i'm like well fuck my life what am i gonna say <laughs> oh my god uh, so i quickly like gather my thoughts and start like doing my best to um convince him and i don't say anything i that i've met or that I'm even corresponding with Catherine at the time until the end of the con. I'm telling you how I'm going to shoot it on blue screen and how it's all going to look and work. And, you know, by the way, Mr. Lacey, if you're saying yes to this one, I, there's a, a second part that, that <laughs> you're kind of have to be part of because I've got this whole, you know, universe in my head. And, um, and that's when he tells me, you know, I was going to cancel. I was, I, we were, my wife and I were going to Italy for a month. And <laughs> so he goes, well, let me, let me think about it. And I'm like, by the way, um, the rules of Madame von Harbo and Madame Carosa, the, the psychic sisters, I, I'm talking to uh, Catherine Lee Scott about playing this. And he goes, oh, at the end of the conversation. <laughs> so I knew that that might help. Yeah. And then um, he called me the next day and he goes, all right, let's do it. And I'm like, oh, crap. We're go I, got, I got Jerry Lacey and I got Catherine Lee Scott. And then Catherine emails me and she goes, Laura would like to meet you. And now I'm like totally freaking out. And I met Laura. And she asked me, do you have lights? I'm like, yeah, I've got lights. I've got lights. <laughs> and then I got home like, mom, dad, we got to go buy lights. We got to go buy lights. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, then they showed up for the read. And then the, the Tim Burton film comes out. We all see that at the movies. And like the week later, we have our table read. And everybody's that Jerry was like the first person there. And my mom, I remember, was like really like freaked out because Reverend Trask was standing in her doorway. Uh -huh. And she was like, she didn't quite know what to expect. You know, yeah. like, he's not Reverend Trask. He's right. Yeah. Um, Self, the childhood of flashbacks. Yeah. And you then know. like one by one, they all arrived and Laura arrived. And, and then we all sat down mm -hmm. and we read the script that I wrote as a teenager. And then we went yeah. and made a movie yeah. for the entire month of June. And mm -hmm. it was just very surreal. And sur sur surreal doesn't even begin to describe it. And there was going to, you know, we knew there was going to be a sequel because I said to everybody, there's, there's a second half there. If you're doing this, some of you have to come back for the second story. <laughs> and so the film was about to open. Oh my God, I got a theatrical release on this stuff. I'm 20 right. years old. Fangoria's yeah. interviewing me. Like, yeah. I, I'm an introvert, misfit kid that has no friends that just sits and watches movies and studies film. And all <laughs> of a sudden, like, all this stuff is happening to me. And I've got like dark shot. These people that I would watch are now like in my cell phone and like talking to me and like, life is very very bizarre um and that's the only way that i can describe it so anyway the film the first film was about to come out the second one we're prepping it and chris panic um catherine had said oh well what if you got chris to play this character this other side character in the first mm -hmm. film and i didn't really want to do that because i i wanted a variety of, of faces and i didn't want it to just be shadows and i thought well we've got we're, i know i've got the second one coming so maybe that might be better to have chris show up in the second film mm -hmm. and chris was only too happy to be professor conrad's in the second film and i also right. when the so when the first film opened we had a premiere down in coronado island and it was the first time i'm like seeing my own work in a movie theater across a 60 foot screen with like loud sound and yes. like the sound is terrible because i didn't have a mic on the first one and, but and it was just really as i said bizarre but i met david selby there that mm -hmm. night and he's like wow. you know maybe we'll do something so then catherine mm -hmm. is also encouraging me you know maybe there's a part for david so we thought david was gonna 
was going to be in the second one and he read that he read it but he was he's like i can't do it because the schedule i gotta go shoot for matt weiner who <laughs> is doing <laughs> mad men <laughs> yeah but you know keep me in mind for something i'm like i will and um <laughs> chris i'll tell you so as i said this life is very strange and surreal and i'm not used to all this attention and and movie scrutiny and you know all this stuff is happening and so we had the movie premiere the night before the day after was like a dark shadows luncheon mm -hmm. and james storm was there chris is there david's there Catherine, jerry laura and i meet chris now in person for the first time after sort of talking to him and i <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, this is, I have to cuss here because I'm quoting Chris and it's like, it makes the story. But I, he goes, hey, kiddo, how are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm having a panic attack right now. He goes, well, don't worry, I'm having one right now too. So we'll both have a panic attack together. <laughs> and I immediately like felt at ease. <laughs> yeah. He was so like, so jubilant and so full of, as I said, electricity and love yeah. and excitement and enthusiasm. Yeah. He's like, I can't wait to get to work. And then like three weeks later, we start filming the second film. And, and that was a huge learning lesson and an ordeal of, of filmmaking. But yeah, now they're all, yeah. they're all like, I mean, Lisa's, I worked with Lisa, I worked with John Carlin, mm -hmm. and everybody, David, and they're all yeah. like this weird, bizarre extended family of mine. Like I, it's, it's great. And I, and you sense, yeah. I think, you know, from when you watch uh, the interviews with them or the, them interacting the actors interacting at the festivals and uh and in catherine's books you certainly get the sense that they went through that experience together oh, yeah. and there's a very strong bond a protective sort of bond oh, yeah. about the show but about just about that experience each there's other. there's a definitely about, di each other there's a that dynamic no it's i i say exists. this yeah i say this the collins family they do exist and it is them <laughs> they are they are a family. They are they yeah. they are a family. They are they have their ups and downs, but they sure. they are a family. They love each other. There's they've been through the trenches. It's That's clear that family. bond they, is there, and not only with the yeah. actors, but certainly with the I mean the surviving. Yeah, sadly, oh we lost God. a lot of people, but you know, with, with especially Lewis, yes, with and Dan and especially Curtis. as time has gone on, it's yeah. it's become even deeper and stronger. And you know, they all deeply care yeah. about each other, and they're all incredibly down to earth, yeah. incredibly genuine kind i could not ask i mean you know every everybody that i've since then have have had the fortune to work with they've all been very nice but to mm -hmm. to be to land as a bewildered 19 year old 20 year old kid into this group of people that had always been there by extension and now they're physically there and to have them guide me and teach me and protect me in certain circumstances educate i mean my god i couldn't ask for yeah. for for better and couldn't Wonderful. be more you know grateful to 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 be part of that world and and, yeah you were instrumental in put, helping to put together you were one of the co-hosts on this uh this past halloween the zoom quarantine theater company yeah. had a halloween reunion for dark shadows and mitchell ryan was there and holy moly yeah. david hennessy yeah what a, Wow, that I mean, that definitely the fandom yeah. was very excited <laughs> about that myself included. I was at a, an outdoor because, of course, we were still in the midst of, of the pandemic. The pandemic still, yeah. We're still are. Toward, hopefully, you know, it seems like the tail end, but let's fingers crossed that this will. Oh, God, die I know. Out. Yeah, gosh, you know, but uh, what a, what yeah, a David, wonderful. We couldn't. We a wonderful thing. I was I was at a party. It was like an outdoor Halloween party. And I was like, I have to get home. I'm not going to watch this later. I have to watch it as it streams because right. this is like such an event, you know, so yeah. talk about that. Like, how did that well, go? Yeah, I mean, that was I mean, Catherine is, is always the the leader of the army. I want to say yes, that. yes, yes. You know, and she instigates things, which is mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. So she had the idea. OK. And then was it like, well, how do we make this work? And then we all sort of, you know, Richard Halpern and Catherine and myself and Jack Fields, we all sort of worked together to, to organize this. And then we knew David Hennessy was going to be part of it. You can't say anything. Top <laughs> secret. Don't say, we don't want anybody to know yet. And uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's it was fun. I mean, it was I was just like happy to kind of see everybody. <laughs> it's like it's been a while. And, you know, I knew that it was going to be our everybody gets together. There was an itinerary. I took questions from all the fans. I had a list of things. I knew all that was going to go out the window because once everybody gets together, <laughs> starts talking it's the it's the family you know i knew it was just gonna be a good time and um it was so cool. i mean as we all know david has like <laughs> I, as a as a kid you know being told the stories of dark shadows and i'm you know little boy me i see little boy david so i'm like that's my identification and, right. I, and my you know 
and I'm like, I now I get to talk to you. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> like that's so. I mean, I didn't ever think that was gonna. I don't think anybody thought that was gonna. I know everybody on the on the reunion didn't think that was gonna happen, and and yeah. then he was there, and it's like, oh damn, there you are, David. You're all grown up. Yeah, um, it's too bad his his connection at toward the end there kind of, yeah, kind of died, but it, but he was still. I mean, but he was, he was there, there for I mean, most for the most part he, yeah. for the, almost the entire thing. He was there yeah, all the way down in Panama. Say, in Panama, yeah, I think yeah, Panama, yeah. Yeah, Iran. he's yeah, he's a you know, very Iran. successful uh, restaurant tour. Yeah. yeah, yeah, him and his wife. I follow him on Instagram. He's always like Me posting yeah. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Him, <laughs> him holding like yes, yeah. He's he's still a performer. Like even though he retired from show business, yeah. there's still that that it's never goes like, away. That's always yeah. part of you, you know. So that was just great. Okay, so so you you we have uh, we had this quarantine uh, theater company you know event happen, which was wonderful. Now, one thing I want to talk to you about as well is sort of um, the influence of Dark Shadows. Actually, there's two parts of this. Dark Shadows itself famously used stories from literature, usually gothic horror literature, but also mm-hmm. a variety of other sources and films as well from, mm-hmm. from the universal cycle. This And this is something that I find a lot of, and I, <laughs> I hate to complain about creativity because a lot of, like, for example, The Big Finish, uh, which, you know, a lot of them are really right. great. It's fantastic hearing the actors back again, you know, but none of the subsequent subsequent versions of Dark Shadows and either comic book form, et cetera, do that where they actually will incorporate classic horror stories into the mix. Like, oh, yeah. they're doing Jekyll and Hyde or they're doing yeah. Wuthering Heights, which is kind of a fun part of Dark Shadows. Oh, yeah. And then oh, yeah. sort of incorporating that story into their oh, world. Yeah. Now, my question to you is, are there any, and I asked Jeff Thompson this too, are there any stories or films that you think could have been incorporated or could still be incorporated into Dark Shadows? like from sort of the library of of classic horror literature and film like and if so which ones danielle i have a really fantastic (laughs) answer for this but i i i can't talk about it on here oh really (laughs) oh no okay okay but yes i totally i would love to see uh, i'll speak for if the show had continued Mm -hmm. um you know into the early mid 70s i would love to have seen what that would have looked like you know as we got into more of the satanic realm and Mm -hmm. more of the slasher realm how would dark shadows have been reinvented to move Mm -hmm. with the times and progress the times but no there's 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 so much other i mean i I guarantee they would have done a demonic possession Oh, I love yeah, the, everybody, the everybody hates yeah. the Leviathans, but I would have loved to have seen a little more Lovecraft. That's because yeah. I'm a Lovecraft guy. Sure. Um, personally, though, speaking, would have loved to have seen. And this was also kind of, I feel, an intention upon Dan. He makes House of Dark Shadows. Now I'm a now I'm I make a movie. I'm a film director for MGM, you know. I've got a hit. I'm going, I'm going Hollywood mm-hmm. and we're going to do Night of Dark Shadows. And if they had done Dark Shadows two, three, and four mm-hmm. back then you know, on location at Lindhurst with the OG crew and and doing anthology films. So it's like House of Dark Shadows is the vampire movie. Night of Dark Shadows is the Angelique movie. And, you know, we do another one that's a, a different kind of movie with some of the other different cast members and stuff and sort of do a different, you know, horror film in the Dark Shadows bubble. Do you know what I mean? Like right, in sure. the mid-70s, like that, I think would have been right. really cool to see. Yeah, and, like sort uh, of the, these encapsulated stories that are yeah. the, the the heading is Dark Shadows, but it's sort of almost like an anthology, an anthologized exactly. yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. And you have that you have the template already there because House and Night are their own thing. Sure, you know yep. they're not exactly prequel and sequel. They are they are their own. They're parallel yeah. times. You know, right? So exactly. Just, just yeah. do whatever you want. Let's do a, a a film that's entirely in the past. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and do one of the. I'm gonna. I need to speak into a tangent. One of the biggest losses that we've got of Night of Dark Shadows or that Night of Dark Shadows incurred is not having Jerry as Reverend Trask. And I asked mm-hmm. him, Jerry, why didn't you? He was, well, I wanted to go do play it against Sam and Sam. Uh, they were filming in San Francisco, yeah. so I yeah. couldn't I couldn't swing it both. Yeah. Well, I but love Thayer David, had, though. You got to love David is thing. great. <laughs> Thayer David is great. And they spelled but his name Jerry backwards. Brings, it's just a Strack, or they did it in an anagram of his name yeah. as Strack. Yeah. But Jerry brings yeah. fire and terror sure. and yeah. a real. Jerry would have been the real villain because yeah. Angelique is not the villain of Night of Dark Shadows, especially if you see the full 128 minute film. Right. She's as much a victim as everybody else. But if Trask or Strack is in conglomerates with Laura, Laura Collins and you know, Diana Millet, she there that's the antagonist. And if we had Jerry as a 
a badass villain in that weird. So mm-hmm. that's what I would love to see. And, you know, in another film of like, let's have more of Jerry, let's get more of Chris, let's get more, you know, of the other crew that didn't get a, a moment in the spotlight. Let's bring Louis Edmonds and Joan back as different characters. Let's sure. do something. It's too know. bad. Uh, it's too bad. Jonathan Frid was, was done uh, at that point. Well, he wanted to do it. He was willing to do a Bromwell movie. Oh, so was he? Oh, I didn't. A, I was <laughs> a gothic. Yeah, yeah. Let's do a gothic yeah. period piece. Sure. And do another. You know, do an entirely. Ori- I mean, Night is an entirely original film, so there's no reason to right. not have done an originally gothic. Um, oh my God, I have so much more I can tell you about Night, about the original versions of that, but maybe I should leave that for Darren. <laughs> like zombie Gerard and stuff. Oh, oh gosh, they were going to do a zombie Gerard. Why? Well, see, I, that's something I wasn't aware of. That. that yeah. So let's you know, let's see more. Let's see, let, what would, you know, you've got Dawn of the Dead and, and the, mm. the George Romero zombie films and stuff. So what would that have been like? Like, how mm. would you have, you know, I guess in a way, like uh, the way American Horror Story, which Ryan Murphy has outrightly said is his Dark Shadows, mm. has taken various genre tropes and twisted it and used sure. its own thing. Yeah. What would, you know, mm-hmm. see when it comes again, to- I'm rambling. I'm sorry. No, 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 not at all. You just, you brought something to mind. Uh, it surprises many people uh, when I tell them, uh, you know, I, I meet a lot of people at the horror cons and stuff as Penny and they talk about movies. I am not a huge fan of the flesh eating zombie because I agree. Yeah. It's, it was, that was an invent. I mean, Romero kind of took ghouls and combined them with zombies and kind of made his own thing. Yeah. And zo- I love the old school zombies. Like I like, walked with the zombies. I walked with as I was about to yeah. say our plague of the zombies. You know that yeah. style of like you know great. They don't need to eat voodoo, them. The voodoo zombies. The voodoo zombies. They're dead. They rise from white graves zombies, and all that. white zombies. I wa- all of I make, or dark I shadows. Qu- a- you know Quentin when he's a zombie. You know yeah. like yeah and, right. You know, or or yeah and it, or the zombie pirates of Gerard. And it's like why do they have to eat people? Like it's like if they're hungry go eat, go to McDonald's. Like I don't know like. <laughs> All like, right. I don't understand why I, I just I, I just never got into it's too, too much for me. For some reason, I like the old school gothic zombie or yeah. voodoo zombie. And every yeah, once yeah, in a yeah. while you see them. But it's like people have that's what I mean about something becoming so popular that it overwrites the it overwrites, previous version yeah, of that. And it makes you right. And I'm like, I like that old school You're absolutely zombie. Right. You know? I would love to do a, a voodoo zombie film like oh, White Zombie. Gosh, and yeah. I Walk to the Zombie. We need I Walk to the Zombie on Blu-ray. Yeah, that's just a crime right now to me that that's not on yeah. Blu-ray. But yeah, anyway, that's that's the mm-hmm. we went off on a totally yeah yes yes what you yes me. <laughs> uh, about it was it was the original topic was just about hor- horror stories that get incorporated into Dark Shadows. I had some thoughts I, that I you know shared with Jeff like Lot Number Two Forty Nine by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which is one of mm-hmm. a, an early mummy story. And Curtis, right. I believe Curtis was very reluctant to do a mummy on Dark Shadows, as I understand it. I can see that being yeah. like oh, it would be kind of hokey. It could it yeah. could be hokey unless if you use Lot Two Forty Nine as your as your basis, I think it could work like a, a scholar who acquires this mummy and then comes to town with it and then or, has a scroll and brings it to life and uses it as a, you know, yeah. Or you could do like, I was going to call it Blood from the Mummy's Tomb, but Jewel of oh, the Seven Stars. Yeah, yes, that yes. That just occurred yeah, to me. That, yeah. I mean, that's, that's Stoker, right? right? Isn't that Stoker? Yeah, it's from yeah. Stoker. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. the incarnation and we already have the sure. reincarnation going yeah it would just be more egyptology if you really yeah. wanted to. uh the king in yellow so speaking, i'll, I'll say know. the one i was gonna say was the woman in black god yes the woman in black if you have not and the movie was actually i thought was pretty cool but the, the play the woman in black is oh, yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. chilling that's it's really good the play is is terrifying it's yeah. excellent excellent gothic horror story with three actors that's it yeah um and okay last question okay so we talked about things what that could be incorporated into the dark shadows let's talk about now dark shadows uh how, particularly the films influenced you as a filmmaker i think in the horror community or you know a classic horror community there are many who you know ho- hold dark shadows in high regard and many who kind of sometimes are dismissive of it but dark yeah. shadows was i think was very pivotal and influential in not only horror but horror, pop culture horror fantasy sci-fi genre yeah. speculative fiction uh right so Definitely. um i want to talk a little bit about that or if, there, if there's anything that you can think of like uh, my friend Eric who was on um, the second episode of the show Eric Marshall pointed out to me something that I wasn't aware of I knew there was a final destination and Eric said it's the dream curse they're doing the dream curse it's, I I have not watched it but it's uh, from what he describes me it's like the victims share something yeah that's true with now someone that, else that... and and the torments increase until you share it with the next person I I haven't watched it but it's I was like that does sound like the dream 
Paris, you know, and you see it in a, particularly in vampire fiction, like uh, Interview with a Vampire, as we know, Anne Rice was a was a Dark right. Shadows fan, and she her story Interview with a Vampire. They did that in parallel time, 1970, with William Holland's head Loomis locking Barnabas, yeah. and t- interviewing yeah, exactly. the vampire, you know, and exactly. and Louis Louis Point du Lac. I, I don't remember his last name. Louis, uh, Louis Pont du Lac. Yeah, yeah. He, Again, he, my mom was reading me this when I'm four years old, and it's so inappropriate. <laughs> like, oh my God. But he's he is cut from the same cloth as Barnabas, I think. Yeah, Louis, the reluctant uh, vampire. Yeah. Reluctant vampire. He does can do really terrible things. There's the the dark side to him, but he's also there's a sympathetic side to him. And Louis is. I remember reading. I'm like, this is mm. this is Barnabas. This is yeah. or he's very similar. Um. Yeah. So, uh, have you seen Final Destination? I haven't seen it. It sounds very I mean, similar. Yeah, Final to Destination. Dream that's the that's the the movies like where I mean those were out when I was in like school. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the okay. I haven't seen you any all of those. Share a, a same vision of death. Like the first one was they were going to France on the plane, and then the plane the engine like faltered, and the plane crashed, and it was really intense. Okay. And then they all were still they woke up and they were still in the airport, and she was like, "Oh, we can't get on the plane. We can't get on the plane. It's going to explode or something." And then it happened. So like five of them got off the plane, and then it happened. So now because they cheated death death is now coming and they all died in crazy ways and then they okay made, like six of them and like four of them are in 3d and, okay i'm i'm not yeah. familiar i just i mean the way eric described it to me, i was like what well, that does, and he does, it sounds but i i haven't seen I, yeah. i'd have to watch them but can you think of other uh well, jeff and i talked about sort of the important role barnabas collins played in in sort of the depiction of vampires in fiction and and in uh well are there other cin- examples you can cinem- think of? I guess cinematically, I mean, there's so much of the, I don't know what was in the air at that moment, but like the the gothic milieu that's spilling out from Dark Shadows, now not necessarily the vampire aspect, but just the whole atmosphere. Mm-hmm. You see that reflected a lot in the early, I don't know, I don't know if you're familiar, I did a series of Instagram, I have. I run a DVD, a film Instagram. Yes, I'm following you on, you, yeah. No, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. AHF DVDs on Instagram, mm-hmm. and I did, uh, through my own very subjective personal uh, collection of movies, the history of horror mm-hmm. from 1931 to 1983. And if you look in the late 60s, early 70s, yeah, I'm sure 50% of it is because of the su- success of, you know, the universal films on television and thriller and the Corman pose of the early 60s. Dark Shadows then begins in 66 and runs to 71. But if you look at 1970, 1971, 1972, there's quite a bit of gothic filmmaking still happening and gothic modern filmmaking. Yeah. So, you know, Count Yorga, you know, the vampire in contemporary Los Angeles or contemporary San Francisco. I'm even going to say Dracula 80, 1972, even though I'm fairly certain that Hammer was not aware of what mm-hmm. Dark Shadows was because it's an American thing and Hammer's very British. Mm-hmm. Although they got house in the UK. Yeah. But, and um, and another cool thing about the Burton movie, they put Chris, Chris they he put got Christopher post, Lee in yeah. it. I was like, oh, yeah. perfect. <laughs> yeah. But that's so good. Another good thing to say about it. Okay. Yeah, and the, the original cast of Dark Shadows. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go, go no, ahead. No, no, no. I was just going. Yeah. Ahead. Um, but so uh, I would say that the definite, and even in the like the Italian, and also you got Mario Bob and stuff, but there's all these sort of, okay, there was a film that I watched called The Moon Child. I'm going to say it's from 1974 and it began as a USC thesis film shot in Riverside at the Mission Inn Hotel. And I shot I shot my film, The Nighttime Winds at the Mission Inn. So that's what that was my primary interest in seeing this movie. And I'd never even heard of it. I just watched it last year during the pandemic. And it's an independent, as I said, USC film school thesis film that got expanded enough to be released on the drive-in circuit. And they have John Carradine and Victor Buono are the two names Mm -hmm. in the the film. But I'm watching this. I'm like, this is Dark Shadows. They're all in period gothic kind of stuff. They're talking about reincarnation and there's a portrait and the thing and they're going back and forth. And and it's all that sort of, as I say, gothic milieu that's that's there. And I, I see that a lot in that era of like 1969, 1973, 74. Or really on the cusp because then you got the exorcist um being emulated that that feeling that tone mm-hmm. that vibe as i said it might have just been you know a, a cross number of things because you have the hammers you've got the international filmmaking but mm-hmm. with like 
my friends Nate and Kelly, as we always say, well, there was only four channels on television at, the, yeah. at that time. That's why this show was a thing. So yeah, it was pretty inescapable. Like you had, you couldn't not take notice. And mm-hmm. if something's making money, you know, you're going to copy that. And if they see MGM raking it in with House, mm-hmm. they're going to copy it, you know, sure. especially, you know, something like AIP. So I hope that was a cohesive no, answer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, I think the fact that Dark Shadows put the mo- the monsters, these monsters who can fall in love and have like Nicholas yep. Blair, you know, develops feelings for Maggie Evans, et cetera. Uh, yeah. and, and having the mo- protagonists of the show be, you know, Barnabas and Quentin and, and Angelique, you know, where Angelique was the antagonist right. of most of the show, but she w- had through periods, you know, they were all yeah, kind of yeah. anti-heroes. They were all like kind of anti-heroes though. Yeah. And and that now on all of these sort of, uh, you know, genre shows that you watch, things like Sabrina, you know, and you see this sort of becomes a thing where I think yeah. prior to Dark Shadows, we didn't see that happen. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the serialized storytelling as applied to genre television is yeah. now is now to be expected. All the Marvel just, shows, you know. Just those- the aspect of the of parallel time alone. I mean, like mm-hmm. I sit and I'm like, my God, how brilliant that was right. and like i remember when chrissy's like yeah and i i looked through the doorway and i saw my other self because i was cyrus <laughs> and i was i forget what the character was but like that concept alone and like a staircase that allows you to travel through time what the hell that is yeah. amazing it's that great. is yeah. so cool like yeah and everybody's like oh well the vampire but like oh doctor sure. who as you said you know yeah. twin peaks you know all these yeah. things the the and now we're seeing it ever with the multiverse with marvel as you had mm. just mentioned yeah. and dc and all this stuff the idea of multiple worlds, multiple timelines, mm-hmm. just that alone, and them doing that on daytime right. television. Right. I mean, they did it on Star Trek, too. I mean, it's an existing yeah. trope from science fiction, but they did in one episode of Star Trek. Dark Shadows had an entire two oh, entire no, two storylines that were yeah. set in parallel. Now, do you believe that uh, the 1841 parallel, I'm going to get really geeky, which I always okay. do on the show, 1841 parallel time is the same parallel time as 1970 parallel time, or do you think they're two distinct parallel times because some of the things don't line up particularly with regard to Barnabas. No, I always I always thought they were all their own little Me too. channels yeah. in time because yeah. also I really have to say I like 1970 parallel time. Everybody hates that. I uh, love it. Oh, I like I love it. And it. it's Night of Dark Shadows. It's yeah. the best storyline they're going <laughs> to use. Rebecca, you know? Rebecca, sure. Yeah. With Jekyll and Hyde mixed in. Yeah. So. <laughs> with Chris yeah. in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, do you feel that Dark Shadows ends when, when Chris drives Catherine away? Oh, no, no, I don't. Uh, I see that a lot recently online where people are saying, oh, that to me feels like the ending. No. Where Maggie that, leaves. <laughs> no, that, that that excises all of uh, 1840, which there are some right. great, great things in 1840, too, especially the first half of 1840. I think when you get right. to the second half, they get kind of bogged down with the with the witchcraft trial for, right. for Quentin. But the first half of 1840, you have amazing stuff, like uh, Julia thinking that Barnabas used the I Ching to go back right. in time, and old Ben and you know, being still sure. around and then they free yeah. Barnabas and he do- has no idea who Julia is and he wants yeah, to kill right. her and he goes after Roxanne and then you have the head of Judah Zachary, Desmond Br- yeah. there's some great stuff in 1840. They know really. how to hook you in. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And Gerard, Gerard become, you know, he's like, oh, this isn't what I expected from Jeez, this like storm. ultimate evil and the layers there with J- Judah and Gerard and the haunting and all that. Yeah. Jim Storm used to also scare the crap out of me. Oh, um, he's terrifying. When I was watching it on sci-fi yeah. Yeah. and you know, like they'd underlight him with like the green gel yeah. and just be lurking at it freak me out sure. and so even like <laughs> he was the one i'll say this he's the one guy like i i finally knew everybody i know i mean for god's sakes i know they're actors i know it's not real I, i'm not of crazy of course you know yeah. I know some people don't. They they totally believe but it. Sadly, but, you know, there are people like that's, that. Yeah. That's just fine. It's just fine. <laughs> but um, because that you know, it's all about luck. And um, <laughs> Jim Storm, though, I was like the he was the one actor that I kind of would like would be a bit <laughs> weary of and kind of avoid. Yeah. <laughs> Even like I sit down and I sit down from like Roger Davis and be like, "Hey, Roger, what's going on?" And I talk to Roger Davis and but like Jim Storm, I was kind of a bit like, "Oh, is Jim Storm?" <laughs> and so and then. I remember even to get like my, my poster signed. I'm like, oh God, I have, I, he's sitting right there. And like, <laughs> I'm helping Jerry. And it's like, 
we're all like, you know who I am. I know who you are. It's been about five years now. Like it's not, uh-huh. it's whatever. But I'm like, oh, I have to go over there. Well, he's, there. Yeah. Sign my poster. <laughs> he seemed like oh, such a, a, a malignant force in the show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was the one. Him and Jerry freaked me out the most. Yeah. I mean, Jerry yeah. with his like intensity and shit, but yeah. Jerry's like a surrogate father. So it's like, it's he, fine now. But Jim sure. Storm is like scaring me from across the room. <laughs> and then he signed my thing. And then like him and Valerie, they came over for Thanksgiving. And so it's all, it's all wow. good. It's cool. <laughs> but it's, but he was the one guy. Cause I was like, oh man, they really like that. You really were scared. <laughs> sure. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. He was he was great. Uh uh to me, Dark Shadows ends where it ends, which is the, the last episode, you know. Right. But but if we're talking about main time, then it's that 1971 January where they come back to the present. Right. And right. And, and Joan Bennett's there. Yeah. Right. And she says, Where have you been? Yeah. You know, that's kind of that where to the, me is <laughs> that to me is the ending. That's like, yeah. okay, that's the and then it'd be interesting to see well, where do we pick up? Yeah. Now? It's almost <laughs> like let's use these actors and do this because. It reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever watched Once Upon a Time on it. It was a Navy Yeah, series. I watched I watched like the first two seasons of it. Yeah. yeah again, I, yeah, totally borrowing from the show. Yes. Oh, yeah. Again, yeah, definitely. And, but that last season of that, like it had an, it, what felt like an ending, like it ended. And then they were like a new season. I'm like, what? Uh-huh. It, it kind of ended. And then the new season is still, it's the same actors and they're sort of playing the same roles, but they're in a completely new environment and they're playing okay. they're, they're You find out they are the same characters, but they've been, their memories have been rewritten sort of like how it started, sure. but, but it's like, Oh wait, this they're playing like, you know, uh Rumpelstiltskin's a cop now. And like, what? What it's uh, it felt weird. It it reminded me of 1841 parallel time. I'm like, right. oh, this is the last season of the show, but it's it's totally completely it's, distinct, gone, separate yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. Like you could watch huh. the last seat the previous season, the end of the previous season, and you'd feel like it's over, which my sister did. She she's like, I have no desire to watch that other season because right. it's so the different. Story included. Yeah. 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 Anyway, speaking of concluding things, we should probably wrap things <laughs> up here. Uh, and so I, I've kept you long enough. Uh, as as you predicted, we definitely I, geeked out and went on a oh lot yeah. of tangents, which was I was hoping would happen. Um, oh, yeah. And as and, I said, we didn't even scratch the surface. There's like a whole bunch. I, we didn't even, like, I know. That means we, we have to have you back. About. We have to have you back I'm, for I'm sure. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and uh, yeah, you were definitely, uh, as as I mentioned to you on Instagram, you were definitely one of the one of the top uh, guests. I wanted to bring in uh, when I started this uh, podcast. Thank you very, very much for having me. I'm, I'm really honored to be to, to be able to ramble here with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to have you. Now, please uh, tell our listeners where they can find out more about your films and where they can watch them. Well, uh, I have uh, The Last Case of August T. Harrison, my complete Theater Fantastique series, my complete Detective Adam Sarah Chronicles are on DVD. You can buy them from oldies.com or from Amazon um, or from Best Buy or wherever you might find DVDs. I do recommend oldies.com though. Yeah. Both Dr. Mabuse films are available on DVD as part of the Dr. Mabuse collection, <laughs> also from oldies. I might announce that there's something in the, we might have a Blu-ray coming soon for the 10th anniversary of Dr. Mabuse, which I cannot even begin to fathom because I'm like, that was yesterday. I made that yesterday. (laughs) It's 10 years ago. And to include the new third film that I really excitedly won the Rondo for. (laughs) Um, And with a bunch of new special features and and footage that nobody has seen and, and stuff. So we'll see how that pans out but you can get the first two films on dvd still from oldies.com as well my film loon lake with david selby and Catherine lee scott is streaming on amazon prime and 2b tv and i believe imdb tv which is a new thing Mm -hmm. Uh, i don't know there's so many platforms out there even i can't keep track it is also on special edition blu-ray which i highly recommend because then you can see how a team of five people with no money uh-huh. made a movie out of state and had a lot of fun making it. Uh, and it's a film I'm very proud of. And then I have my love story because I don't just limit myself to horror and thriller. I did a love story, Will and Liz, a couple of years ago, another film I'm deeply proud of. And that is streaming on Amazon Prime. And if you still can't find everything, there is my website, hollinsworthproductions.com h-o-l-l-i-n-s-w-o-r-t-h productions.com where you can find all the dvds available to order all of 
the streaming links available. Some of my short films that are on YouTube, they're all, it's all hosted there. I'm also on Facebook. If yeah. you want to message me and be one of the many creepy internet people, stalkers <laughs> that I have to block sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I've been and, there, done um, that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I shut off my Facebook for quite a while. And then I the turned like six months, I had it off because I just really needed a break from Facebook because of the internet trolls. Is weird, man. <laughs> yeah. The internet man, is that's weird. You ain't kidding. <laughs> yeah. And then also, I have my, as I, as, as you probably have gathered by now, I love film and film history <laughs> and movies. And so I have an Instagram dedicated to my very subjective love of film. And you can follow me there, AHF DVDs. And apparently I'm also going to be now, um, I have my own film column in oh. We Belong Dead magazine. Wonderful. And Congratulations. Called, thank you. It's called Ansel's Asylum for the Psychotronic. <laughs> oh, what a great title <laughs> it took me three weeks to come up with but um and it's it's gonna be more me writing about film and horror movies and classic film and musicals because i also like musicals because i'm oh weird. yeah oh i do too the last show i was in was uh well the show before that i was in young frankenstein the musical as frau blucher <laughs> oh perfect and then i was in wizard of oz as the wicked witch of the west but she didn't have any songs <laughs> but <laughs> i'm typecast i'm always the witch i don't know uh uh, but uh yeah so oh great i love musicals too so yeah so great. that's where you can that's where you can reach me or not reach me or <laughs> support my support independent film that's the main thing support independent film Please we do. work really hard mm -hmm. we work so hard and we do our best there's no i don't come from an industry family we don't have a studio publicity department it's just me my buddy nate my mm -hmm. friend kelly and all of our hard work and gumption and determination uh, in a very crazy landscape of digital streaming and mm -hmm. you know so yeah, yeah support independent film Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ansel. It was a pleasure talking with you. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, please uh, rate and give us a, uh, a review that really actually helps the podcast uh, in the Google algorithms and helps us come up more often so that fellow Dark Shadows and spooky movie fans can find the podcast. And you can email me at terror at collinwood at gmail.com. If you have any suggestions for a closing line for this podcast, because I still haven't come up with one. Ansel, do you have any ideas, any thoughts you want to throw yours? I've gotten a few suggestions already, a few good ones. I'm going to put them up on Facebook for a vote so that folks well, I on guess, Facebook can vote. <laughs> I guess we started it with incestors. So I think <laughs> oh, the best way, the best way to close it is I don't understand. Oh, Ooh, I, I love just, it. I don't understand. <laughs> okay. I well, can't do Julia clutching my throat. Well, uh, you can't see that. But Vicky. It, <laughs> and until next time, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. And don't be an I, internet creeper. Uh, don't, yeah, don't be a troll. <laughs> there were no trolls on Dark Shadows, so you're not allowed to be a troll. That's one creature they didn't use. All right. Nope. <laughs>